We who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright. You're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. Hello, Mac Pack. It's great to be back with you for another exciting episode of On the Move with Mac Worley III. Of course, I am your host, Mac Worley III. And we've got a big show, a really big show in store for you today. I'm really excited about it. Uh, first hour of the program, we're going to be interviewing a driver of the company Lyft. You may be familiar with their competitor of the Uber taxi drivers. Uh, he was suspended for having his gun in his personal vehicle. We're going to have him tell his story. Uh, we also are going to be talking about an eighth grader reciting a poem titled White Boy Privilege. So we're going to have to talk about what is white privilege. Uh, the second hour of the show, we're going to be joined by Dan Sandini of the Daylight Disinfectant. He's going to join us to talk about the Trump campaign and how the justice system is failing the Bundys. Uh, also, we're going to be talking about how phase two of Obama's plan to federalize the police force just happened in Baltimore. This was last month, so it's not just happened. It's a little old news, but we're going to cover it because we're talking about uh, today's show, Todd, by the way, is uh, guns, white privilege, and power grabs. So we're going to be talking about power grabs that are happening right now. Uh, one of them is the federalization of the police. The next one, the DHS, is now Department of Homeland Security. They, they are now talking about how they might declare the election system's critical infrastructure and take it over. So it's the federalization of our elections. Furthermore, uh, we need to discuss what is happening to the price of gold. Someone is artificially manipulating the price of gold. There was a huge drop in price, and it was because of these massive sell-offs uh, that took place in under a minute. We're going to talk about that. Then I want to get into this uh, this act, this piece of legislation that is uh, being uh, pushed by Ted Cruz and some other uh, congressmen and women called the uh, the Protect Protecting Internet Freedom Act. Uh, so this has to do with the United States. On September 30th, uh, we're about ready to turn over the Internet to ICANN. It is a uh, international body uh, bureaucracy. Essentially, that's going to govern the, the internet, and it's going to give Iran, Russia, China, you know, all these despots around the world access to censor the internet. Uh, again, the internet is an American invention, and we're just going to turn it over to the rest of the world. Sure, no big deal, right? We're going to talk about that. We got a whole lot of other topics that we're going to discuss. If you would like to join today's conversation, feel free to give us a call. The number to the show is three six zero four five zero five six two five. Again, that number is three six zero four five zero five six two five. You can also get us on facebook.com slash on the move show. You can message us there. You can get us on Twitter at on the move show. Please feel free to message us. We'll read your, your messages on the air. Really excited to talk to you guys. The Mac Pack phone lines are open. So without further ado, let me just go ahead and get the housekeeping stuff out of the way. Uh, and first and foremost, if you're just joining the program, I am really grateful that you took the time to, to listen to the program. I know you have a lot of options out there when it comes to talk radio, and I really appreciate you giving us some time to bend your ear, talk about today's issues. Uh, I personally myself am a libertarian with some conservative leanings, and I view the news through that lens. So I'll give you my perspective on that. On this show, we talk about all sorts of things, guns, governments, rights, philosophy, that kind of thing. And, you know, I talk about how I believe things ought to be. And, and again, if you disagree with me, that's perfectly fine. Please feel free to give us a call. Again, that number is 360-450-5625. Don't forget to check us out on our website on the moveshow.com. You can follow us on Spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com slash on the move show spreaker.com slash on the move show if you follow us on there you'll be really helping us get the message of liberty out you'll be helping analytically speaking people find the show the more people that find it in search results the more people will you know be able to listen to the message and get involved and all that so you're really helping us a great deal you can check out our show on itunes uh you can also uh 
Check us out on YouTube.com slash On The Move Show. Lots of original content over there, so please feel free to check that out. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at On The Move Show or like us on Facebook.com slash On The Move Show. And if you would go to our website, OnTheMoveShow.com, you click on the shop link over there. we got lots and lots of originally designed products for you. Uh, we got the Bare Arms t-shirt, or it's actually on all, all these different de- uh, these designs are on uh, coffee mugs, uh, t-shirts, hoodies, phone cases. So we got the Bare Arms design. Uh, it's a picture of a bear with the word arms written over it. Very, very cool. My wife designed it. Um, we've got the Be Libertarian shirt again. All these are designed by my wife. Uh, we have have the hashtag Never Trump shirt. We've got um, all sorts of other stuff. I heart open carry, all, all those things. So whatever you're, you know, whatever you're into, if you're a liberty-minded person, there's going to be something over there for you. So please feel free to check that out. Again, that's on the com. Click the shop link. All right. Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and cut to a commercial break. When we come back, we're going to dive right into our featured topics. You guys don't want to miss what's coming up next. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore. With the support of like minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at oathkeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with Canada to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright. You're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. And we're back. So at this point, I believe this is our guest, the Lyft driver. His name is Jordan. Uh, hey, Jordan, are you on the line? Caller, uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Caller. Uh, I guess they couldn't hear us. All right, uh, give us a call back if you want to talk on the show here. Uh, anyway, folks, so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and go into something else until he gives us a call back here. Uh, let's see. I want to talk about uh, some of these bubbles here that are going on in our economy. Uh, we have, as I've talked about on previous episodes, we have the auto loan bubble, the student loan bubble, Obamacare itself has become a bubble, the U.S. bond market has become uh, a bubble, uh, and uh, let me see here. Sorry, I'm uh, trying to line up this guest here. He's uh, he's saying that the line keeps dropping. All right, sorry about that. Live radio, folks. Always something that goes wrong. Uh, you know, it's been a while. it's been a real long time since uh, since we've had any real issues on live radio. Hey, caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, Jordan Morgan. Hey, Jordan. All right. Jordan. Gotcha. Got you on the air here. Okay, so uh, first of all, everybody, this is Jordan. He's the uh, the Lyft driver. Again, Lyft is a competitor of Uber. He had a situation where uh, you were suspended, am I right, uh, from your job as a Lyft driver for having a gun in your private vehicle? Uh, per- permanently, permanently deactivated, actually. Okay, so why don't you start from the beginning here and, and tell us exactly what happened in this situation. So, you know, as an Uber, Uber and Lyft drivers, we have to uh, constantly clean out our car. I'm part of an airport crew, and um, we're, we go to the airport, and we wait in the lot. And my car was dirty that one day, and I realized that my concealed carry was in my uh, my lockbox. So I got it out and put it on so my passengers wouldn't get it. 
And then I proceeded to clean out my car. You know, someone came up to me, asked, well, do you have a firearm? I'm like, yeah, I, I carry a firearm on me doing this job. You know, you can have anybody in the world in your car. And so I thought nothing of it. And prior to that, I had one lady that said something to Lyft, and Lyft told me something about firearms, and if you're legally allowed to carry, it's okay. And then when I came back to the lot after a few pickups, I was sitting there, and a police officer um, was staring at my vehicle in the lot, Port of Portland. And so I, you know, I have veteran plates and all that stuff. I got out, and I was like, hey, I'm going to help you. He's like, are you carrying a firearm in your car? I'm like, yes. Um, he's like, hey, can I see you can still carry ID? Handed it to him. And then about the time I handed it to him, uh, about eight other officers rolled up. And they were sitting there talking. And he's like, well, your concealed carry is completely valid. I see that you do uh, security. Um, there's no problem you us and all that stuff. I went back to my car, and I couldn't get back on Lyft. Uber at the point already heard about it and wasn't too worried. And uh, then uh, I got an email from Lyft saying that you've been deactivated for having a firearm in your car. And I went to try to talk about it. I'm like, hey, I'm legally allowed to have this. And they said, well, for, for passenger safety reasons, we can't reactivate you. And pretty much that's how it went. And then it was back and forth with them. And then they stopped responding to my emails. I see. So you are, uh, you're permanently deactivated. Are you also driving for Uber? Yes, I drive for Uber. Okay. So it, Uber doesn't seem to have a problem with this. Uber does have a problem with it. So I'm not saying I carry when I'm working for Uber, but... They normally don't. There's a million drivers that carry for Uber. Most of the people that carry um, stop Lyft, driving for Lyft for that reason. I see. So the the question, when you first brought this to me, the question I had for you is, what do you what do you want to accomplish out of this? Uh, it, because obviously, it, I, you know, I personally believe that even if it's a wrong policy, a, a, a private business has the right to, to do whatever they want with their company. Uh, but... Uh, it's it is a stupid policy, and I think that you know if if you don't like that policy, you probably shouldn't be supporting Lyft uh, or Uber if they have the same policy. Uh, but what, what would you like to see done here? What would you like to accomplish with this? And what are you working towards doing? What I'm working towards doing is uh, actually getting those policies removed. Because first off, we do not work for these companies; we're independent contractors. Therefore, it is our personal vehicle. What I have in my personal vehicle is nobody's. If you're asking me, hey, can you please use your personal vehicle? to do this. As long as I'm not, if I'm following the city of Portland's laws, which is the city of Portland has no problem with drivers having concealed carries, I've talked to them. I've talked to, I had a person that worked for the Supreme Court of Oregon, and he says they shouldn't be doing that. So what I'm trying to get done is have those policies changed because this is our personal vehicle. We do not work for you. We do not work for you. The only thing we are doing is leasing your technology. Because if we get an accident and a pastor injured, they will throw you under the bus as quick as they can. But then they want to come in and say you can't have a firearm on your car. And I'm, I'm assuming if anything happens to you, they, they don't cover you. Uh, there's no kind of insurance or anything that if, if you were held up or something uh, or, you know, you, you end up getting injured or, or worse, uh, you don't get any kind of compensation from Lyft, do you? Nope. And if you were to hurt that person, um, they would deactivate you. Even if a person were to rob you and you were to defend your life, they would deactivate you. They'd say, oh, wait, we have nothing to do with him. He's not an employee. And that's how this, this company, these companies are getting away with not having to pay, you know, Social Security, anything else that a normal employer pays. And so they can mitigate their liability. My main thing is if you're doing that, we should be allowed to carry firearms in our car. Absolutely. You know, I, I agree with you completely on this. Uh, I mean, if if there is no, it, it's obviously first of all, it's obviously your property. It's not like they're you know you're on their their property in their business or something. Uh, it's your property. I agree. You should be able to carry. Obviously, uh, the fact that you're a contractor, this is where you start hitting some some legal gray areas. And, and I, I personally, I don't have enough uh, enough know how when it comes to you know what the courts say. And, you know what co what a company can do. For or a contractor telling you what you can carry in your private vehicle or anything like that. Uh, but just just my philosophy here when it comes to this, you know, if this company is going to treat their, their contractors this way, because you're not technically an employee, correct? Uh, technically, no, we're not. Okay, so if, if they're going to treat their, their contractors this way, and again, they don't, they're not providing any kind of uh, protection for you, and they, even though 
So they're, they're creating the liability uh, by putting you in this situation where you're unarmed. And as you said, anybody in the world can get into your car and, you know, and attack you, assault you, steal your vehicle or worse. Uh, you know, the, the, there should be because they, they are creating the, 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 the situation in and of itself. They're the ones that are creating the situation by disarming you in the first place. There should be some legal liability behind that with them. Uh, but I think the best answer here, in my opinion, is to try to, as you're trying to do, to try to change what Lyft is doing. So uh, what methods are you tr are using right now to try to change it? Other than just talking about it on this show, what, what, are, we, what are you doing on your end? Well, I have contacted the NRA, but they've been dragging their uh, dragging their feet on this issue so far because I'm pretty sure they don't want to get involved with all that's going on. They don't want their name in the paper right now. Mm -hmm. But another thing I'm doing is I'm talking to other drivers. I know a lot of the drivers are caring. We're trying to get together and, you know, let them know that, hey, we're not evil people. If you look back in uh, Boston, I think in 2015, there was a, uh, a guy that uh, there was a, a man that went – went to a crowd that was coming out of a concert and started shooting. There was an Uber driver that was carrying at the time. He got out of the vehicle and engaged the hostile person. And he managed to stop this event from happening. I would really like us drivers to get together and say, hey, not everyone that has a gun is evil. We're, all, we're also doing this because, you know, I carry not for myself. I carry for my passengers. If something happens for my passengers, you know, we can defend our passengers. And it's our job to do a service. So I'm trying to put the pressure on Lyft and Uber to revoke their policies. Uber, not so much. Uber normally doesn't get in our business as much as Lyft does. Lyft is still trying to push that very far left agenda because it's the company they are. So what kind of what kind of responses have you gotten from Lyft about this policy? Uh, they bought my email address. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's not very helpful. <laughs> Well, folks out there, if you would like to get involved here and you would like to do something uh, to try to convince Lyft to change their policy, uh, we have a customer service number. I just Googled it for you guys. Uh, the number to Lyft, if you would like to contact them and tell them that they should change their policy about uh, concealed carry for their drivers, uh, the number to Lyft is 855-865-9553. Again, that's 855 855- Eight six five nine five five three, and call them. Let them know that you don't support this. Let them know that if 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 this matters to you, that you you're, you're gonna not use Lyft. You'll use their competitor Uber or whoever. You'll use a regular old taxi cab because you don't want to support this business if that's what you choose to do. But this is this is to me this is the way to answer this. If a company has a bad policy, uh, rather than trying to use the government to force them to change it or to make it illegal uh, as would you know we would be doing if if we had the government consider you guys as employees or something like along those lines I think the best answer is the free market answer and that is forcing them through public opinion the the, the court of public opinion to try to change the, their ways do, do you agree with that I 100% totally agree with that because if you throw if you try to do a legal battle they'll just try to settle out of court and they'll try to shove everything on their run under the rug. But if you have people that actually know what's going on and will tell vocalize and boycott their system, well, then they have to respond and they have to change their policies. Absolutely. So one more time, that number is 855-865-9553. Jordan, do you have any kind of uh, social media or anything like that that you're pushing on this that you'd like to share out to get people involved in? Actually, you are uh, the first person that I really went to other than NRA. Because I I saw what happened to you in Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so I know um, right now I do have a YouTube channel. It's Doc Hazard, but that's about it. I talk about a million things. It's low key. I'm just you know guy in this car while I'm driving Uber. Yes, sir. But you know, if I get some more, if I get some more traction, more support, some of us drivers are trying to get together and already do stuff. So I'll launch that. But I want there to be a word out going around before I start anything big. So Absolutely. I'm not, you know, singled out by a corporation. Well, well let me tell you, man, uh, don't wait around for someone else to do it. You know, take, take the initiative well, no, here and, 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 and try and try to start this stuff yourself. Because if, if we all wait around for someone else, you know, it's nothing's ever going to change. So, uh, well, I'm, I'm saying I, I am, I am pushing the issue here locally at, at the time with other drivers. Okay. But like I said, I'm, Use word of mouth right now with the drivers until we can all sit down and you know fix something up. Yes, sir. Yeah. If if you need any any attention.
attention on this. If uh, any change, anything changes with this, please get back on hold of me. I'm happy to, to share this out and give you a little bit more exposure and what little I can do here. Uh, but, yeah, if, if you need anything else, please, man, f- feel free to get a hold of me, okay? Okay, will do, sir. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, man. I really appreciate it. Well, you have a wonderful day. I am thankful to have the opportunity to speak with you. Yes, sir. All right. Well, thanks again. I, I really appreciate your time. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, folks, one more time. That number is 855-865-9553. Again, 855-865-9553. If you disagree with with what Lyft is doing to their drivers, the position that they're putting their drivers in, please call them up. Let them know that you disagree with this and tell them that because of this policy, you are going to go somewhere else. You're not going to patron their business anymore, and uh, you'll be happy to go to one of their competitors who does not have the same policy. So anyway, folks, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and cut to a commercial break. When we come back, we're going to dive right into the t- uh, featured topic here, the next one. I want to talk about white privilege. We're going to start off with, with uh, playing this poem from the eighth grader, reciting the poem titled White Boy Privilege. You don't want to miss what's coming up next. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, pledging my life, my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me God. Join us at oathkeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley and I work with Canada to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright. You're listening to On the Move with Matt Worley III. All right, we're back. Appreciate you all sticking with us to the break. So at this point, I want to talk about about white privilege. What is white privilege? And why are people talking about it so much? And why is it being taught in our classrooms? Uh, it's an interesting subject. It's an interesting topic, honestly. It's a weird dichotomy of where uh, if you're white, <laughs> I actually just had this conversation with uh, uh, my good friend Mark Delphi. He's going to be calling it in a few moments here. Um, he was saying that, you know, because I'm white, I can talk about white privilege because I have that privilege. Uh, But at the same time, I'm also not supposed to talk about white privilege because I'm white. Um, It's this weird dichotomy of where you have the privilege to do all of these things that that, that you're allowed to do, but then you're shouted down for doing those things by people who are saying that you have white privilege and you, you can only talk about issues pertaining to white people. You can't, if it's not a white issue, if it's not a white male issue, a straight white male issue, you can't have an opinion on it. Um, now, look, I, I'll be the first person to say that there are policies and uh, laws within the federal and state governments that have a disproportionate impact on different communities, uh, and not just with the uh, with the minority communities. I will be the first to admit that the war on drugs has had a disproportionate impact on African American communities. Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's really no doubt when it comes to that. Uh, and 
I'll also be the first to admit that the welfare state has had a disproportionate impact on African-American communities. So my, my answers, my, my solutions here are not because you're, you're white, you, you have this privilege and we need to, to shout you down and tell, and tell you you can't possibly know what it's like because you're white and to try to silence or censor you. Those aren't my, my answers. My answers are to actually affect, affect the root cause. Uh, when it comes to the war on drugs, if we're having an issue where minorities are being policed at a disproportionate rate than any other uh, demographic, uh, then the issue is the war on drugs. And the reason why black people are being policed at a disproportionate rate is because that's where the crime is. Unfortunately, the African-American community has a, a, a murder rate uh, eight, to ten high, eight to ten times higher than whites and Hispanics combined, even though they only comprise only 13% of the population. And for the past 30 years, they've, they've com, uh, had 52%, the African-American uh, population has comprised of 52% of homicides in the United States. Again, only, only consisting of 13% of the population. So they're punching way above their weight. But we're not allowed to talk about this, being white people, straight, male, white people. Not allowed to talk about that. Uh, okay. And, and most of the time when I have conversations, because I'm seeking these conversations out, I want to genuinely engage with people about this issue. Most of the time, when I start bringing up facts, when I talk about statistics, people, people start talking about feelings. They instantly refute the facts. I don't have the facts with you. Or, oh, you know what? Facts don't tell everything. You know, facts can be bent to, to make make your point, to make things seem some, somehow like they're not. Mm, uh, no, not. I mean, yeah, you can use some stats, but uh, really, when, it, when you when you look at the fact that there is a huge, disproportionate, uh, violent crime rate coming from one demographic, and then you start talking about why this demographic is policed at a higher rate. I, that right, right there is your correlation. And again, coming from a law enforcement background, if you don't know anything about me, uh, I was security forces in the military. Uh, I, look, I, I'm, I'm not trying to, to say that I know everything it is to, uh, about law enforcement, but I do know some things. And I also have, have talked to experts on this subject. I've talked to police officers. I've had some sheriffs on the show who've discussed this stuff with me about how they do proactive policing. And proactive policing is one of the methods that is being used right now, and that is having a disproportionate impact on minorities due to the violent crime rate. Again, the, the, the vast majority of, uh, of crime is happening in low-income housing areas. Low-income housing area it has a disproportionate amount of African Americans. And because the crime is there, again, the way the police police is they will look at where crime has happened historically. These are almost like pre-crime, minority report style police tactics where they go out and they look at where crime has happened historically. And then they say, okay, well, we've had a crime here and within this block radius every single year at this time or on this day so we we go out and we'll have a patrol in that area and they, it's it tries to deter crime so anyway now that we've laid that down here i want to just play this poem from this eighth grader this poor little eighth grader who's been indoctrinated to hate himself and think that you know he's got he's got a privilege and uh you know he he was born up on the top rung of the ladder of success everyone he's eighth he's in eighth grade and he's already you know, Mark Zuckerberg, rich. Right. So here's the poem. You decide for yourself. My name is Royce. My poem is titled White Boy Privilege. Dear women, I'm sorry. Dear black people, I'm sorry. Dear Asian Americans, dear Native Americans, dear immigrants who come here seeking a better life, I'm sorry. Dear everyone who isn't a middle or upper class white boy, I'm sorry. I have started life at the top of a ladder while you were born on the first drum. I say now that I would change faces with you in an instant, but if given the opportunity, would I? Probably not, because to be honest, being privileged is awesome. I'm not saying that you and me on different rungs of the ladder is how I want it to stay. I'm I'm not saying that any part of me has for a moment even liked it that way. I'm just saying that I fucking love being privileged and I'm not ready to give that away. I love it because I can say fucking and not one of you is attributing that to the fact that everyone with my skin color has a dirty mouth. I love it because I don't have to spend an hour every morning putting on makeup. 
make up to meet other people's standards. I love it because I can worry about what kind of food is on my plate instead of whether or not there will be food on my plate. I love it because when I see a police officer, I see someone who's on my side. <coughs> to be honest, I'm scared of what it would be like if I wasn't on the top rung, if the tables were turned and I didn't have my white boy privilege safety blanket to protect me. If I lived a life lit by what I lack, not what I have. If I lived a life in which when I failed, the world would say, told you so. If I lived the life that you live. When I was born, I had a success story already written for me. You, you were given a pen and no paper. I've always felt that that's unfair, but I've never dared to speak up because I've been too scared. Well, now I realize that there's enough Blakey to be shared. Everyone should have the privileges that I have. In fact, they should be rights instead. Everyone's story should be written, so all they have to do is get it read. Enough said. No, not enough said. It is embarrassing that we still live in a world which we judge another person's character by the size of their paycheck, the color of their skin, or the type of chromosomes they have. It is embarrassing that we tell our kids that it is not their personality, but instead those same chromosomes that get to dictate what color clothes they wear, and how short they must cut their hair. But most of all, it is embarrassing that we deny this, that we claim to live in an equal country, in an equal world. We say that women can vote. Well, guess what? They can run a country, own a company, and throw one nasty curveball as well. We just don't give them the chance to. I know it wasn't us 8th grade white boys who created this system, but we profit from it every day. We don't notice these privileges though because they don't come in the form of things we gain, but rather the lack of injustices that we endure. Because of my gender, I can watch any sport on TV and feel like that could be me one day. Because of my race, I can eat at a fancy restaurant without the wait staff expecting me to steal the silverware. Thanks to my parents' salary, I go to a school that brings my dreams closer instead of pushing them away. Dear white boys, I'm not sorry. I don't care if you think the feminists are taking over the world or the Black Lives Matter movement has gotten a little too strong because that's bullshit. I get that change can be scary, but equality shouldn't be. Hey, white boys, it's time to act like a woman, to be strong and make a difference. It's time to let go of that fear. It's time to take that ladder and turn it into a bridge. Woo, boy. So much to talk about on that one. So, hey, Mark, are you on the line? Oh, no, Mark dropped off the line. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, wait for him to call back, I guess. Let's uh, let's go ahead and start chopping this thing up here. The first thing, first, first things first, he talks about how he was born on the top rung of the ladder of success. This is, this is what he's referring to, this ladder of success. Again, he's in eighth grade, and uh, I don't really know what kind of success he thinks he already has. As, uh, I mean, I guess he's he's gone viral on YouTube, so there's that, uh, but it's because he's talking about his privilege, uh, so I'm not quite certain what that entails. Um, you know, we're actually, we're having some technical difficulties here with uh, with the phone lines here. I'm going to, we're going to cut to one more commercial break. Sorry about this, gang. When we come back, we're going to see if we can have Mark on the line, and, uh, and we'll talk about this. So anyway, we'll be right back. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore with the support of like minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at oathkeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha. 
Crystal Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright. You're listening to On the Move with Matt Worley III. All right, folks, we're back, and I believe we have Mark Delphine on the line. Hey, Mark, are you there? I am. All right. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Sure. We certainly appreciate it. We already played the eighth grader reciting the white boy privilege poem, uh, and I kind of want to chop this up with you. Uh, you saw this poem, right? Yes. Okay. So, first of all, what was your what was your first impression of this? It's uh, you're obviously only able to show this because you're white and you have white privilege. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. <laughs> But by the way, Mark is uh, is trying something different on today's episode, folks. He's uh, it, it, why don't you explain uh, what's different about you today? I'm really drunk right now, Mac, there and I go. love it. All right, so I, I thought this beautiful would be beautiful in Seattle today too. Yeah, I, th- I thought this Just would saying. be fun. It'd be uh, it'd be a great uh, a great little conversation here. <laughs> get get Mark all all juiced up here and uh and loose. You only can do this because you're white and you have white privilege, Mac. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, again, uh, but I also can't do it because I'm white and I have white privilege. So Well, uh, you can't. Yeah, I can't, and I, I can because I have white privilege. Yeah, sure. again, it's, it's that simple. It's way more fun this way, though. So, so I, on, a, on a serious note, for one moment here, uh, what do you think uh, about this, um, this eighth-grade white kid talking about how he was born on the top rung of the ladder of success and how minorities are, are literally born on the on the bottom and they're also because of you know systemic racism and things like that they're unable to achieve the same level of success as a white person what do you think about that mark well number one the greatest american celebrity of all time is an overweight black woman who was molested and raped in the south extremely poor uh and her name was oprah She became a billionaire. This is the greatest example of how that's BS. Okay. But for the most part, that's an exception, not a rule. And while I want to make her an example, I understand that most people of color have a legitimate gripe about the United States and how there's a clear difference between who is a winner and who is not. Look at Colin Kaepernick right now. This is a guy who's protesting in the United States. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's had such, down a, he's the, had such a hard life, right? He was he was adopted by a white family. Now he's making six figures or more, actually. Uh, oh, seven. Playing, seven. Yeah, pl- playing like, sports. Probably, yeah. No, I think seven. he's making eight figures. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Probably, probably a lot more. What was it like a thirteen million dollar deal? He's yeah, he's got a lot of figures. Yeah, yeah. He, he's he's got a he's got a lot of reason to really hate the United States. I I completely get that. Uh, Mark, I don't think he hates the United States. Now here's the here's the difference. Hey, he's not hating his country, like protesting what's going on, and that's the beauty about the United States. And this is what I love about this country so much is that you can sit down during something like this and not get busted for it like you can in, say, North Korea or in, say, another country that is not so capitalist or not so free market. So we should be praising the opportunity. We should be loving the idea that you have a country that has the opportunity to peacefully protest against what you see is a wrongdoing. Whether you agree with the wrongdoing, you have to be able to love the idea that there is a country that you live in that won't bust you for something until, of course, Donald Trump is elected, <laughs> who will be mandatorily like mandating patriotism classes, which all of you like, d bags out there who love 
Donald Trump in some places <laughs> is a guy that should be president. You should probably rethink that because the guy is going to be mandating that kind of thing. But go ahead. Okay. All right. All right, well, we'll talk about that in a second here. Remind me to talk about that with you here. So, uh, you know, and- Mac, I'm reminding you right now. Thank you. Go ahead and talk about that in a second. Appreciate that. The, the little reminder there. Uh, so, with with Colin Kaepernick, and, and for example, you mentioned Oprah. I mean, we happen to have a black president sitting in the White House right now. Uh, you know, there. This country is great because anyone can be successful. Uh, uh, and again, I, I argue many of the same points that you do as far as uh, the, the fact that there are some disproportionate uh, programs and laws, p- policies that affect minorities disproportionately like you know, the war on drugs and, and the welfare state. Again, the welfare state has decimated the black family, created o- – was it over se- – I think 70 percent of black families now do not have a father. Uh, in the in the picture, uh, again, about, that's the drug war. But go ahead, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, also the welfare state it has to do with that as well, because the the welfare state incentivizes there there to be no uh, no male uh, father in the in the picture, no father in the picture. They actually get paid more money for a single single parent household. So, the, do you really think that they like think that though? Do you think abs- they absolutely. think that out? And they're like, you know, yeah, you know, if, if you're not in the picture, then I get more money. Mark, I don't think they honestly think that. Though. I got I got a question for you. Then. And do you, do you have a lot of friends or family or, or or have a lot of relationships with people that are mooching off the off the state or living in in the welfare state? No, but I grew up on food stamps and government cheese and housing. Okay, well, you know, I, again, I I personally I've never been on the dole, but I have a lot of relationships with people who who live off of this stuff, and I I know I know how they are. They're, they're they're trying to look. Not all of these people, by the way. I don't. There are some some people that legitimately are looking at this as a social safety net, and they're they're trying to get off of it. But some people, and I argue the vast majority of the people that I know that that that, that have been using the system have been mooching this and milking this for every single dollar they can get. They know how the system works. They know how to they know how to make the most money, and they know that they they make a whole lot more money with a single parent household than with two parents in the picture. They. Know no, uh, I don't know the system. I, I totally, I totally disagree with you. I think those most people are not trying to be people who are moochers. It's just like if you think about minimum wage, the majority, the strong majority, like eighty percent of people who are on minimum wage are only on minimum wage for a year or less. Is that people want to exceed? They want to excel. They want to, they want to make more. They want to do better with their lives. But if you set up a system where it discourages something like that. Then people have that kind of crossword, crossroads mentality where what they're trying to do is go, wait a minute, if you tell me that I'm working hard and then I'm being taken off of the system, then maybe, just maybe, I might actually not want to create more. I might not want to be better. I might not want to work harder. And some of those... And that's systems, where the problem with the system is. So some of these things that you're talking about, for example, if you if you get a promotion at work, you take extra hours, uh, you you may end up getting less on welfare than you do overall because your your now your income your actual income that you're providing has increased, so it, it lowers your overall income from the from the dole from the from the welfare, and then overall you're making less money because you're not getting so much in benefits anymore. The the people that are on this they know this a lot of people i'm not saying all of them i know i'm generalizing and i know there's some people that are in genuine need that are on welfare and i'm not if that doesn't apply to you and you're over here saying mac you're a jerk blah 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 whatever look I, i'm not it doesn't fit you i'm not talking mac, about you are a jerk there you go but if, if it doesn't fit you i'm not talking about you but i know i know the people that i know are that are mooching it they know every in and out of this system they know how to squeeze every single dime out of the government and, and you were talking like Donald Trump. You know, you're like, oh, you know, I heard some people talking, and once in a while I heard somebody saying something. Who do you know who actually is doing this? Not come on. Well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dime them out on the air, man. That's <laughs> name that's, their names, call them out, throw them under the bus right now for the sake of journalism. No, thank you. I, I, I will not do that. But uh, anyway, so so let's let's go to the, some of the other things in this uh, this eighth grader's poem here. He says that police are on his side. And, you know, because of he, him having white privilege, he feels that police are his his friends and they're on his side. So, Mark, do you agree with that statement or no? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, seriously, I have, 
Okay, I, I listened to one, one time, and this is honestly, this is like, I think it was on The Daily Show, which you just have to take it for what it's worth, considering that it's more of a left-wing kind of publication, but Sean Hannity, who is John Stewart's favorite person, of course, Sean Hannity was like, talking about, yeah, you know what, I'm a little police officer, I talked to him about how I have a gun, and how I talk to him about blah, blah, blah. blah. And then you saw this guy, I'm not sure, was he in Michigan, where was he, but he was like, he totally, I mean, he talks to a cop about how he has an open carry license, how he has a gun, and the cop just flat out shoots him. And you so, guarantee uh, okay. yourself, uh, ho- hold on. this guy would Break not battle. have been shot Break had the guy we don't, not we don't actually, been We don't actually know what took place in that car. The the video that that was that was started rolling. I saw I saw this video. Uh, the woman's you know given a narrative of what happened. We don't know. The cop may have been out of line. I don't know. I'm I'm waiting to really comment on this until all the facts are in and the, the it's it's been settled in court. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. Neither were you. What do you think happened? I don't know. As, as far as I know, that guy could no, have been reaching. No, but speculate for a second. What do you think happened? Who, who, I mean, there there are two options here, basically. I mean, it, realistically. The what guy, they said? W- number one. Or what the cop said? Num- yeah, number right? one. What, what the think? cop said or or what the what the person said. So so the person, the, the woman sitting in the passenger seat says that he said he had a he had a concealed carry permit and he was reaching for it in his glove compartment and the cop just shot him out of nowhere okay that could have happened if that happened the, the cop should be disciplined that's that's one specific case but let's let's look at all the other cases that black lives matter is talking about we, t- we talk about michael brown he's involved in a strong arm robbery he attacked a police officer tried to take his gun then tried to flee from the the, the situation the cop turns around the cop what's that Says the cop. Sa- says, says the, the cop. Says Obama's DOJ, led by Eric Holder, who who tried to do an investigation of that to prove that the cop was guilty, and found out that the cop wasn't. And then the ballistic reports from the medical uh, medical uh, team that came out and checked the body and all this stuff, they found out that it, it's consistent with the cop's report. This is this is not this is not speculation. You're obviously racist. Um, you're obviously racist. White and privilege. You're just white power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Yeah. So, look, this is this is case after case after case. It gets blown up in, by the Black Lives Matter uh, group movement, saying that oh, systemic racism. These police are just out there shooting unarmed black people in the street. Again, it's been proven wrong after time after time after time. All these officers keep getting. Uh, uh, now, maybe maybe you think that the the courts are rigged and the, these grand jury systems are rigged, and it's it's more likely for the police to get off because of it but they, they keep getting proven to be innocent so uh you know i'm sorry uh, uh no, no 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 i don't agree that they keep getting proven to be innocent. okay well they're, they're, there's not enough evidence to prove that they're where guilty you have a at group least of people who are basically white who are basically conservative what? who the grand jury is selecting do you, do you even know the, say, the consistency that the, how many the, the races that comprise these grand juries because the, the one in baltimore i believe was majority african-american and i know no, the one in uh, in uh, Ferguson was, and pretty great. That was a pretty bad. Ex- that was a pretty bad example, though. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Black Lives Matter has not created some pretty crazy examples. You know, just to throw at it. But any kind of loss, any kind of situation, is going to basically say, "Oh yeah, we've got a crazy example for you, and here it is." But the idea is. You are treated differently by the police if you are black. Okay, question. And I don't disagree with that whatsoever. I completely do, and and the reason why, and even if I even if I'm wrong on this, let me just point out as you I are. mentioned, even if I am, let's just point out that that, that there might be a reason that the African American uh, race or uh, ethnicity may have some some culpability for why they're treated differently. Again, for the past thirty years. Despite only comprising 13% of the population, they have committed 52% of all homicides in the United States. They have a, a homicide rate eight to ten times higher than whites and Hispanics combined. Now, that have been convicted. No, I'm t- talking about. Oh well, it, maybe, maybe, maybe there's some that are getting away with it. Is that what you're saying? There's some that are getting away with murder. No, I'm so maybe they're committing even like, more. Well, wait a minute. What if you're wrongly convicted? What if you are? You know. What I'm saying is that it's not necessarily a jury of your peers. So wait a second. What I'm also saying are you, is that are you telling 
<laughs> me that that the majority of the of the murders that are happening from the African American community could potentially be wrongful convictions, and that they're they're actually these numbers are actually inflated or cooked because. They can't afford good lawyers. The, the the justice system is disproportionately against them. Yada yada yada. All the stuff that the Black Lives Matter says, systemic racism, all of this stuff. White juries convicting black people for murders that they didn't commit. You're tr are you saying that for the the statistics where they've committed fifty two percent of all murders for the past thirty years could be wrong simply because of racism or systemic racism? Sure, I could say that, but I'm not saying that it's the majority of them. I'm just saying that I definitely agree that there is some complete bias in the judicial system in the way that juries are selected, in the way that juries vote, in the way that black men are convicted. E even if that and were I, true, all right, let's, let's assume that even half of, that, of these, just let's say half of them are, are actually uh, being wrongfully convicted of a murder that they never committed. Then that would be what twenty six percent of murders in America. They they still only comprise of thirteen percent of the population. So they're still swinging way above their weight. There is a a problem in the African American community with violent crime, and I argue it has to do with the war on drugs. And I argue that there are some also secondary tertiary effects from the welfare state that, that's resulting in this because they can't make more money. They can't get that raise. They can't spend more time working in a legitimate means because they end up getting less welfare money. So then they turn to another way of under the table way of making money, usually the war on drugs, and they end up fighting over turf with other black gangs for drugs, uh, drug territory. And that's what we're seeing in Chicago. That's why black on black crime is huge. It's so many people dying in the streets. And more importantly, Mark, it let's we talk about the police being on your side and now that's where we got on the subject here as a white person i don't feel like the police are on my side i don't feel like any government official is on my side uh it, now maybe there is some oath keeping peace officers out there and i have the utmost respect for the ones that uphold the constitution and they're just trying to make the community safe but let's point out that white people have a higher percentage according to studies now you can refute the study if you want, Mark, but white people have a higher percentage uh, chance of getting shot by police officers than black people when in a, in a violent altercation. Uh, white people ha have less hesitation between when the cops pull the trigger than when they, they come up uh, against a, a black person who's, who's being violent. They actually have a, a, a few second extra delay between pulling the trigger with an African-American person. That may have, have something to do with the Ferguson effect, uh, where police are, are aware that anything they do could go viral now and they could be the next officer, Darren Wilson. But the fact is, is that white people are, are, are being killed by police. In fact, more white people are killed by police than black people. Black people there are more white people in the country. But yet more black people commit murders. It, it, you know, I, this, this is the thing that, that I... There is no <laughs> a higher percentage, maybe, but are you talking about numbers? I mean, that's the yes. thing. Are you saying numbers, or are you saying percentage? Both. Are you being consistent with it? Both. They, they commit fifty-two percent of all homicides in America. Fifty-two percent, and they have done so for the last thirty years. Okay. Well, if that's the case, I'm not. Listen, I'm not necessarily saying that black people are responsible for problems. What I am saying is that black people are being held responsible for problems that they're not necessarily causing. You, you, what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, that I am treated differently because I have a white privilege, whereas a police officer treats an African American much different because they don't have the white privilege. My point yes. is, my point is that yes. why do the police officers, if they do treat black people differently, which I contend that studies show that they actually do treat black people better. They're less likely to shoot them. They have a larger delay between shooting them than when they're dealing with a violent white suspect. I contend that the, the, the issues that you say that you know aren't necessarily the black people's problems is the black people's problems. Why are police uh, more likely to shoot them? Because they're committing crimes and they're committing violent crimes. And uh, white or police uh, police officers are more likely to be shot. I think they're eight. Ah, uh, oh, crap! I can't remember the number. I think it was like somewhere between eight times or ten times more likely to be shot by uh, an African American suspect than they are to shoot 
an African American suspect. So, it, I mean, the fact is there is there is a lot of issues going on in the black community right, right now when it comes to violent crime. I don't think this is inherent in the race. I don't think there are more violent people. What I am saying is that there are there are policies that are having a disproportionate impact on them and causing causing incentives for them to go into that you know the go into drug games try to make money under the table, engage in violent crime to protect their territory, and that's why we're seeing uh, essentially a genocide. We're, see we're seeing far more people being killed, far more black people being killed by other black people than by police. But yeah, Black Lives Matter doesn't talk about that. And, and let, me, let me ask you here. You, you said that police, you, f do you, you feel like police are on your side? No, but we don't pay Black Lives Matter to, nor do we pay black people to protect the lives of individual citizens. We pay the police to do so. Michael so they Brown. should be held under a different scrutiny. Michael Brown was, was involved in a strong arm robbery. Eric Gardner was violating the law, selling loose leaf cigarettes on the side of a sidewalk without paying a tax to the government. I disagree with that law itself, but again, he was violating the law. He resisted the arrest. Uh, what's the other one? Um, oh, shoot, that kid that was, uh, was beating up uh, George Zimmerman. What's his name? Trayvon Martin, yeah, he jumped. Martin. He jumped George Zimmerman. And by the way, this whole narrative of that—he, you know, he was just going to get some Skittles from the corner store. He posted on social media that he was going—he's going to mix it with drugs, and that's why he got this stuff. This isn't an angel like the media, the media uh, painted him out to be. This kid attacked somebody who who it's was. Sullivan, have you seen how many times George Zimmerman has been busted since then? I mean, George Zimmerman is a douche. Look, that I, guy I, has not, I'll be the last person. Times. I'll be the last person to defend George Zimmerman. Uh, I, you know, but well, but, what I'm saying is, is that George Zimmerman is not the kind of person that you should defend. Regardless, Trayvon Martin. I'm not necessarily saying Trayvon Martin was an angel. I'm saying is that Trayvon Martin shouldn't have been killed. Trayvon Martin. Oh, what, what would Zimmerman, you do if you're armed and you're following somebody who you think is suspicious, who you've never seen in your neighborhood? Granted, well, you probably I'm would never do that. Him. Okay, but that's not but against the law. Why is he it's following? Not against the law to do that, Mark. So let's just, let's it's, say it's, it's I know you're not going to It's against the law. It's also not against the law to have an open carry AR-15 on your back. It, it, it is against the law. It doesn't mean that people aren't going to follow you and like be skeptical of you, it, right? It is against the law to assault someone. It is against the law to tackle someone to the ground, punch them in the face, and and, and smash their face into the concrete. So you know, th though I though I understand what your point, and again, are you talking about George Zimmerman or are you yeah, talking about Trayvon Martin? Tra Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin attacked George Zimmerman, I MMA style, ground and pound, was mounted on top and punch him in the ground, uh, punching his head into the cement. So what would you do if you're being attacked? If he shouldn't have followed him in the first place, he shouldn't have been playing, uh, you know, uh, community police. But he he was, and he did, and because of that. Uh, he got attacked again. It wasn't he didn't he didn't violate the law doing that, but he, he he was attacked, which is against the law. Trayvon Martin attacked George Zimmerman. That's against the law, and he defended himself. He he was a fear for his life. And but that's his word against you. I mean, I heard the I heard the call. I heard the guy. I heard Trayvon Martin saying, "This, this guy's following me. What is this guy doing to me? He's he's trying to get me." So Trayvon Martin was on a phone call. Talking to his girlfriend, or talking to his friend, I'm not sure who he's talking to. But he's basically saying, this guy's following me and he's trying to get me. If somebody follows now, whether you, or not do you have a right to attack them? Just because they're following no, you? No, I'm not saying that, but, but that's what I'm, what I'm saying. I'm saying, I don't know for sure that Trayvon Martin attacked this guy first, is all I'm saying. Well, that's, I mean, according, according to the what court. What I'm saying is, is that a court of law basically allowed or got George Zimmerman off. And in my opinion, had it been a white man who was shot by George Zimmerman, George Zimmerman would have been busted. I, that's my opinion. I, yeah, that's now, your whether opinion, or not you agree is a facts... matter of subjectivity. It's a complete opinion, but you and I might disagree on this. But what I'm saying is that when it comes to Trayvon Martin, and when it comes to this new fucking, uh, I'm sorry, when it's it comes right. to this new guy who gets, but, like this, this college student, who gets busted or and serves what three months out of six for a a rape when it basically is, has all it has to do is the fact that this guy is white. If this guy was Hispanic, if this guy were black, this guy would have been busted. 
We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this more in a second, Mark. We, we got to cut to a commercial break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to stick uh, or we're going to have a uh, uh, Dan. Sandini on the line from Daylight Disinfectant. He's going to be joining us in this conversation. we got a lot of other stuff to talk about as well. Uh, so you guys don't want to miss this. We'll be right back. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, pledging my life my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me, God. Join us at oathkeepers.org. Support for On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright. You're listening to On the Move with Matt Worley III. And we're back. All right. So at this point, uh, we're going to be joined by my good friend Dan Sandini of the Daylight Disinfectant. That's daylightdisinfectant.com. Hey, Dan, are you there? I am here, Matt Worley. How are you doing today? Doing really well. We're having a good time. Uh, we had some technical <laughs> issues on the show earlier, but we got I'm sorted out. Hey, Mark, are you still on the line? I sure am. Hey, Dan, how are you? Hey, Mark, how are you doing today? I'm happy. How are you? <laughs> All right. Oh, so, so what do you guys do later? <laughs> All right. So, so guys, uh, let's let's. It sounds like you're too happy with George Zimmerman earlier there. Or uh, or uh, or. Uh, it sounds like you're too happy with Donald Trump, but I'm going to tear you apart for it. Okay, hold on, oh, hold on, no. hold on. Let me, I, I'm metaphorically getting between you guys here and, and putting up my hands. All right. So so hold on oh, one second. Oh my god! I didn't know you were you were you were open to put me into this. I don't know so you're no. chill. No, 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 I, I was no, 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 no. There's no, there's no rope a dope. I didn't set you up here. I'm actually going to be try to be a moderator. This moder- is an ambush, Dan. I, I'm, I'm going to try to be a moderator here between you guys. This sounds uh, so much like Theodore used to call into, uh, who used to call into uh, Lars Larson show. You're who? not Theodore called into Lars Larson show. Who? Who me or Clark? I promise I'm not. I'm really? Wow, wow. wow. you're the team. Oh my God! It's Mark Feldstein. Yeah, How are you doing today? it is. <laughs> you I didn't even know. I told you I'm great. Okay. Happy. Come on, man. Okay. All right. Hold Let's on, guys. Get to the issue. Hold on. Hold I'm on. great. Let's, Thanks for Let's get to it, guys. All right. Hold on. Hold on. All right. So we played. We played a video about white privilege. This little boy, uh, eighth, eighth grader. He was talking about how he has white privilege and how he's he's born on the top rung and uh, every you know black people or minorities are at the bottom. They start out at the bottom. And that they can't get any further from there. Although we have a black president, Oprah, Oprah is so rich. Her name is synonymous with wealth. You're Oprah rich. Um, and again, we were talking. One of the, one of the points he made, Dan, was about how he feels like police are on his side. Now, now Dan, I know uh, me personally. I've had my runs with police, and I, you know, I was unlawfully arrested while uh, not violating any laws whatsoever. And guess what? I was convicted. Uh, and then afterwards, I won my appeal. Uh, so again, I was wrongfully convicted. I don't feel like the justice system gives a crap what color your skin is. They're out to get you, no, no matter who you are, what the color of your skin is. And Dan, let me ask you: What, what do you feel about this? Do you think that the police well, are on your side? Hmm. A, you know, you're both right, and and there's a, in that situation, you're both right because I think that um, 
Well, Mac, you're right from the perspective that if they're out to get you, they're out to get you. And once they want to get get you, they're going to get you. And that's just not up for conjecture. I mean, that's that, that's documented in several books. And our system goes after people based upon certain things. And in this case, Mark is right. There's really no conjecture to the fact that police are rewarded and promoted on the number of callers they make. Okay, so in that particular example, it's so easy in these quote-unquote black neighborhoods like in northeast Portland and uh, in Harlem in New York City and in Chicago all over the place where it's very easy on these minor drug crimes to get these, uh, to get these young black people in these, in these uh, neighborhoods. And, and once they're in that spiral, it's impossible to get them out of it. And, and that, that happens quite frequently inside of big cities, and I think it's profiled that way. So these guys can make easy callers and get promoted quite quickly through sergeant or up through lieutenant or captain and on the chief of police by the number of callers that they're making. And, uh, the, and that's how they and it makes money that way, too. You have to look at it from the perspective of the attorneys. And one, in here in the state of Oregon, you know, Mark, you're from here, uh, you know, one of the biggest groups is the attorney skills here, here in Oregon that makes these huge contributions to the judges so that, they, so that they get elected here in the state of Oregon and politicians as well. And so that, that by doing that, they're ensured the fact that legislation that is pro a revolving door, I'll just put it that way right now in the conversation, but which promotes a revolving door of people coming in and out of the prison state to, to, um, to, uh, to get those people in office, to get those judges in office, they're going to be favorable to their cases in the future. That's definitely one of the mechanisms there that happens with blacks. But you're also right back from the perspective of conservatives. And the police are definitely here in the state of Oregon and in the state of Washington. I can only speak from practical experience in both of those places, out to get conservatives and not to in any way help conservatives, which is the other side of that, okay? So they're targeting us based on political beliefs. They're targeting blacks simply because it's not because they're racist. I don't believe that. I believe that they're just easy callers to make, and we can get into why that exists, why those people are such easy targets. And the answer, when you get to the bottom of it, is liberalism, liberal progressivism is, what, is the reason why those people, why that, why blacks are so easy to get arrested. So, so I don't think we disagree. Why is it liberalism? Tell, me, tell us about liberalism. Well, ho- hold, on, hold on one second, Mark, because I want you to actually comment. Because, Mark, I know you agree about them targeting because of the, it being easy callers, correct? Yeah, no, I don't disagree with Dan at all about that situation, except I don't understand what he means about, like, you know, the targeting conservatives. I mean, I, I would say the media is definitely targeting conservatives. I mean, if they, the media is going after it because it's an easy target, because the majority of the people who are watching the media are a left-leaning scale, but I don't know that the majority of the cops or the majority of the judicial system is no, going is after conservatives. Right? It, what's interesting, Mark, is that it's not, I think the, the street line cops, are, the, the guys who ran for file, they're getting a little pissed at conservatives here in the Portland area, but they're really, not really, they're willing to settle for what's fair, okay, based on political beliefs, okay? I think that the average cop based on political beliefs is mostly there to, to enforce the law, okay? But what you get is district attorneys, okay? Who are who are uh, responsive responsive to the voters? Okay, looking at situations and saying, "Hey, this guy is the conservative. Hey, he's breaking the gun law. Uh, hey, this is a perfect chance for us to make an example against the Second Amendment." And I can speak it's from personal experience. Well, okay, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I wouldn't disagree with that. I wouldn't disagree with that. So I, the I, district attorneys and the judges. I've got a lot of thinking on this topic. <laughs> Tell you, yeah. I really have. And so the, the the mainline cops, but you see, here's the deal. Here's the deal, Mark. What happens is, is once you get on their shit list, I can say shit list, right? Mark, drop the up. You know what? I guess, I guess this is going to be the explicit the show. This is, this is going to be the explicit show. I'm going to have to label this explicit. By the way, sorry, folks. If you have kids, we're just going to be dropping F-bombs all over the place right now. So I already dropped the F-bomb, Dan, so feel free to drop the F-bomb. I heard that. Yeah. Go for it, Dan. Actually, Dan, let me ask you. So, so why, why do you think it's easy? Why, why do you think it's an easy collar for uh, police officers to target minorities for drug offenses, uh, low-level drug offenses? 
Well, I don't know whether you have it on the On the Move show bookstore, but you might want to have that. It's Thomas Sowell's Economics 101. And I know, Mark, Mark, congratulations, Mark. I don't think I really congratulated you for getting your MBA, but I'm sure that you went to several economics classes in order to achieve that. Oh, I read, I read Thomas Sowell all day and night. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's, the, that's really the answer there, is that, you know, if you look at any of his books, you're going to find some of it on there. And by the way, I didn't know Thomas Sowell, but when I read that book, I took it out of the library here in Portland, and I, I read it, and I said, wow, that's fantastic. That's the best economics book I've read since I left my MBA program. And he really nailed it in terms of how, you know, Democrats buy the black vote through subsidized programs like subsidized housing, uh, food stamps, um, any number of programs, free phones, all of these things, but not, no jobs, okay? Basically, taking the, taking the, the fire out of uh, employers hiring anybody by putting these outrageous corporate taxes on them and then redistributing that wealth in terms of free goodies that keep them on the couch. That is a failed war on poverty. And you can look back to see when it began under FDR or even before then, after World War I that started with Wilson, okay? But th that whole, th that whole uh, making people slaves to the system and giving them free goodies in order to buy their votes. So basically these young, uh, virile people in the most productive years of their lives, from the ages of 18 up through, you know, their late 20s, is, is taken away from them because they live in these areas of just blighted areas of people that are on the public dole. And, and you want to talk about failed war. The biggest failed war that we have had in the United States is the failed war on poverty. And Ronald Reagan, while he was in office, did, he didn't do everything perfectly. Uh, there were a lot of things that Reagan did not do right, okay? But one of the things he did do was to get people off of the dole, okay, and begin that moving in the right direction. And it just hasn't nudged in that direction since then. You're looking at, take a look at under Barack Obama. I think you have in some age demographics for black males, you have 50% unemployment. In places like Chicago, you're wondering why it's an easy, it's, it's an easy target. Where else are they going to get their money for their drugs? Once you try, once you're living a miserable life and you try meth or you try, uh, I think, you know, various drugs, marijuana, whatever it might be, you know, you have a tendency to continue to do that to make your life a little bit easier during the day. You, you know, you move towards these intoxicating substances. And, and it just gets them in it. Now, we, we can get into the fact on whether you should be able to smoke marijuana or not be able to smoke mar marijuana, okay? But these little petty drug crimes, in terms of watch the wire on, uh, on, um, on Amazon Prime or watch it on, uh, on Netflix, I don't think it's on Netflix, it's on Amazon Prime. But, but uh, you, you know, you'll watch the, the businesses that these people become parts of. Okay, watch Narcos. The, the uh, second season just came out on, uh, on Netflix. But these, people, these young people are trapped into the only business in town. Okay, their parents are all working for the school system in the diversity programs. Okay, which means they're not working at all. They're on the they're on white collar welfare. Okay, they're not working on a standard life, which is so so they're trapped in that sort of cycle. Okay, of do nothing jobs that are non productive, and most of the kids are trapped without jobs. No one's offering these kids jobs inside the black community. And, and maybe themselves making them dependent on the system. Here in Northeast Portland, you have them wanting to put in, I don't want to hog the whole microphone here, but, but in Northeast Portland, you have them wanting to put in a productive uh, supermarket in, in Northeast uh, Portland, a Trader Joe's. I don't know if I can say that on the air or not, okay, but it's a great new <laughs> business. We can bring in a lot of those malls with Trader Joe's in it. I hate to say if you agree or disagree with par Planned Parenthood, and that kind of stuff, they're going to put one of those in, and usually they put one of those for uh, low-cost medical services and those kinds of things in those malls. They are great for an African-American community. If you're going to try and keep African-American communities, the, they lobby, the, the black leaders lobby in that neighborhood to keep Trader Joe's out. And you know where it is? In exactly the same place as it was right right now, that, that neighborhood. But it's, ter it's terrible. So I try to make it to the of Portland. So you have all these, all these, you said, yeah, the question, getting back to the question, I think I've just gone through it, is why are these neighborhoods the way they are? Why are they such an easy catch and release place for, for cops, for throwing your kids in, in the, 
it's a revolving door. And the answer is it's the poverty that's inflicted on them by the uh, progressive liberals. Exactly. And, and you know, the, this, I think, is, is something that is a, an identified problem. You know, the, in the video where this eight-year-old or eighth grader is uh, reciting this poem, he talks about how he's, he's ashamed that people are judged by the size of their paycheck the color of their skin and the clothes that they wear they wear and this is first of all he starts to interject marxist ideology in here because they identify the problem uh, at least some portions of the problem uh, the size of the paycheck the inequality as far as of, of how much wealth these people have and, and the fact that there's a disproportionate poverty rate among african americans uh, they that they've identified that problem correctly although the solution to the problem and the other problems that they identify with are incorrect Again, you are correct. I believe that uh, these uh, progressive policies like uh, the, the war on drugs, the uh, expansion of, uh, of the federal Leviathan Schedule 1 and marijuana, and, and again, the war on drugs, whether or not you, I mean, you believe it's a, it's a Democrat-supported policy, they do support it because it, it enhances the federal Leviathan's power. And again, the more control, they're all about control. Even progressive Republicans are about control, which I contend. And you would disagree Mar or, uh, Dan that Donald Trump is a progressive but we'll we'll get we'll get to that in a moment here uh, but as far as as far as what he's saying the size of your paycheck is, is one thing this is Marxist uh, because he's talking about how people shouldn't be treated differently or judged differently uh, based on the size of their paycheck and he says that everyone should story should already be written it should just be a matter of getting it read uh, this sounds kind of communist in, in, in ideology to me you have oh you see, my god that's it, terrible who is it what are you reading can you, can you just rehash that here, here i'll tell you what folks I, i'm gonna go ahead and play this clip again here and, and that way mark and uh and and dan can both listen to this uh one more time you guys can re reiterate here i'm gonna go ahead and uh, mute skype here's a clip my poem is titled white boy privilege dear women i'm sorry dear black people i'm Sorry, dear Asian Americans, dear Native Americans, dear immigrants who come here seeking a better life, I'm sorry. Dear everyone who isn't a middle or upper class white boy, I'm sorry. I have started life at the top of a ladder while you were born on the first rung. I say now that I would change places with you in an instant, but if given the opportunity, would I? Probably not, because to be honest, being privileged is also I'm not saying that you and me on different rungs of the ladder is how I want it to stay. I'm not saying that any part of me has for a moment even liked it that way. I'm just saying that I fucking love being privileged and I'm not ready to give that away. I love it because I can say fucking and not one of you is attributing that to the fact that everyone of my skin color has a dirty mouth. I love it because I don't have to spend an hour every morning putting on makeup to meet other people's standards. I love it because I worry about what kind of food is on my plate instead of whether or not there will be food on my plate. I love it because when I see a police officer, I see someone who's on my side. <coughs> to be honest, I'm scared of what it would be like if I wasn't on the top rung, if the tables were turned and I didn't have my white boy privilege safety blankie to protect me. If I lived a life lived by what I lack, not what I have, if I lived a life in which when I failed, the world would say, told you so. If I live the life that you live. When I was born, I had a success story already written for me. You, you were given a pen and no paper. I've always felt that that's unfair, but I've never dared to speak up because I've been too scared. Well, now I realize that there's enough blankie to be shared. Everyone should have the privileges that I have. In fact, they should be right instead. Everyone's story should be written, so all they have to do is get it read. Enough said! No, not enough said. It is embarrassing that we still live in a world in which we judge another person's character by the size of their paycheck, the color of their skin, or the type of chromosomes they have. It is embarrassing that we tell our kids that it is not their personality, but instead those same chromosomes that get to dictate what color clothes they wear, now short they must cut their hair. But most of all, it is embarrassing that we deny this, that we claim to live in an equal country, in an equal world. We say that women can vote well, guess what? They can run a country, own a company, and throw a nasty curveball as well. We just don't give them the chance to. I know it wasn't us eighth grade white boys who created this system, but we profit from it every day. We don't notice these privileges, though, because they don't come in the form of things we gain, but rather the lack of injustices that 
we endure. Because of my gender, I can watch any sport on TV and feel like that could be me one day. Because of my race, I can eat at a fancy restaurant without the wait staff expecting me to steal the silverware. Thanks to my parents' salary, I go to school that brings my dreams closer instead of pushing them away. Dear white boys, I'm not, not sorry. I don't care if you think the feminists are taking over the world, but the Black Lives Matter movement has gotten a little too strong because that's bullshit. I get the change can be scary, but equality shouldn't be. Hey, white boys, it's time to act like a woman, to be strong and make a difference. It's time to let go of that fear. It's time to take that ladder and turn it into a bridge. Woo! Okay, Dan. <laughs> what do you think? He needs, he needs, uh, why can't I, I, I talk? Want to, uh, I'll let you talk. Give me a second. Everyone have Dan talk first. Let Marco, yeah. Let Marco. I've really been hogging the bandwidth today. Go well, ahead. We've, we've, we've talked about it for, for a second. One, one second, Marco. Hey, Dan, I want you to go, and then, Mark, I want you to comment on what Dan says. Is that, is that cool with you? <laughs> okay. He's a professional. I mean, I, I really can't get too much of the audio, but I did listen to it when you posted it on Facebook. I listened to it like the first minute of it. So, but, you know, this is just exactly what the universities are, are turning out, and it's moving lower and lower here in Portland. They teach it inside of the schools now. They, it, they have actual classes, you know, on white privilege for teachers. Here yeah. in Portland, they've had, you know, uh, what do you call it, White History Month. Um, we, and we should talk about that a little bit here in Portland, you know, White History White History Month, and, uh, you know, it, there, this whole idea of white privilege, okay, inside of society and the fact that you can't get rid of it, okay, that's always going to be there and that you and I are racist, even though we've never done a racist thing in our lives, it, it's, just, it's just wrong, okay? It's just wrong. Racism does exist inside of societies. There's both types of racism. I've seen, I've seen myself, other videographers called Cracker, and worse than that inside of some of these meetings that we go to, to to videotape them. So there are definitely people who uh, stereotype me because I'm a white guy, okay? There's no problem with that. So that goes both ways. And I also think if you look, if you he's wrong from the perspective that if you look at, at statistical books, like Freakonomics is one of them that did it, um, and that's why a New York Times, that's, that's a New York Times author that helped, I think he worked on the book with a statistician, and which is, it's just a great book. It just turns statistics on its head, okay? And basically, it says no matter what school you go to, really, even if you're these crappy schools in the inner city, you still have an equal chance of actually becoming a very successful person in life coming out of those schools. That those circumstances breed people who, you know, who actually succeed in life as well. So, you know, he, he's, he's got the perpetual victim philosophy ingrained in his head and he is also saying that he that the end justifies the means that's 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 a real problem with his head okay because when you embrace back to the black lives matter movement I, you know i have videos on my channel of me talking to Teresa rafer i love Teresa. i disagree with her 100 percent, but i you know but i do love her when i see her i mean i don't you know pretend to have fought her battle in life but she refuses to decry random random violence against police officers. Refuses to decry people who walk up to cops and blow them away. What's a natural thing to come out of how you, if you're treated that way in life? Well, that's a bunch of BS. Okay, there's difference between right and wrong, and the, and if you want to go after cops to uh, to help rectify the system based upon behaviors that they've exhibited, which hurt things, that's fine. But, you know, not being able to come out and say, look, I have a problem with that, that we're actually just blowing away police officers at point blank range just to make a point. And she and the mayor of the city is sitting next to her and refuses to say anything. It's a big issue there, okay? And there's a huge issue there. And it's, that's, just a, that's, a, uh, that's an example of progressive politics. And one of their fundamental rules is the end justifies the means. So victors get to, the victors get to rewrite history, and you know, that's all about Saul Linsky and the way that they think about life, and, and I just totally 100% disagree with it. The ends do not justify the means. And, and killing, I mean, I mean see, that's a huge missed opportunity for these people. And Mark, maybe you can comment that on that a little bit, but I think it's a, it was a huge missed opportunity for the Black Lives Movement to not matters movement to not say, 
hey, look, we decry random violence against police officers. That's not us. We don't want that, okay? If that's what you stand for, then we don't stand with that. And actually to reach out to the victims groups, reach out to people who are targeted by, say, the, uh, by, say, the um, IRS, okay? And to reach out to patriot groups, okay? I know you can't say, hey, reach out to the Tea Party people, but reach out to these patriot group people that are victims of, of the similar sort of profiling by the United States government, they would produce a movement on the, that. That's what tied Occupy together. That sort of work is what tied Occupy together as a huge movement. And why Black Lives Matter is going to never amount to anything. It's just going to do the big fade, okay? Because they refuse to get on the fact that police officers should not be killed for just doing their jobs. And uh, I guess that's the way I feel about it. So, so it's, it's wrong. So, uh, Mark, Mark what, first of yeah, all, let, let me, let me yeah, ask you. I mean, what, what, what you do gotta, you think? You've got to understand. I mean, here's the thing. What was the leader of the Tea Party movement? There was no leader unless you consider Sarah Palin, and I would call that an embarrassment. There's no leader of the Tea Party movement, just like there's no leader of the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a group of people who are upset with the system. That's the whole point of the Tea Party movement, the whole point of the Occupy movement, the whole point of the Black Lives Matter movement. And the beauty of it is that there is no leader of it. So when you can call people out for doing certain things, like one, like, random crazy guy shooting a cop for, you know, no reason. I mean, it was, it was horrible. I mean, I'm not saying I'm justifying it, and I totally condemn the idea of shooting a cop to protest a situation. But what I'm saying is, is that for the exact same reason that the Tea Party movement was called out for being racist, even though you saw maybe one or two people who had a horrible picture of Obama and a negative racist movement or a negative racist racist, like, picture, the exact same thing is that you can say for the Black Lives Matter movement and for, like, being a, like, like, there's one random or maybe a couple of random, horrible, crazy people who are representing, quote-unquote, the movement. What I'm saying is, is that when you're talking about a movement with no clear leader, you've got to say that it's the media who is calling out and then an entire group or an entire movement of people simply because they don't want a revolution. And I agree. I love a revolution. I love the Occupy movement. I love the Black Lives Matter movement. Exactly the reason why I have the Tea Party movement. Because we're talking about a group of people who are fed up with the situation and they're trying to do something, for the most part, peacefully. For the most part, well, they're, they're, fed, they're fed up. Movement. Movement. They're fed up. I mean, let, just... Just so we get the record straight, not just so the history and the actual the actual history and my personal experience with these people is as follows. Okay, Teresa Rayford calls herself the head of Black Lives Matter here in Portland. I can show you the quotes. Okay, and she sat at the head of the table with Mayor Hales while I was in the room. Okay, next to him. Okay and would not decry this. And what I confronted her with as a question from the media was, look, I'm walking along. You can watch the videos on my YouTube channel. Well, the first thing I'll do we got this call is put them up on Max's page, okay? But we're walking with these people, and they're chanting all the cops in the ground was part of the chant that I'm coming along with. Uh, and I, there were other things. They had Christmas carols that we were talking about. Uh, violence they they also did... Pigs in blanket, fry them like bacon. That's in reference to uh, police in body bags. Yeah, what's it called? Name the yeah, the name of the whole. Oh, oh that's a pig in a blanket. Oh, that's so sick. Yeah, that, that, and that's exactly that's exactly what I called her out. All she had to say is we cry this kind of violence against police officers. It's not us, okay? And she calls herself beyond the room full of black people in a black church when I'm sitting there, okay? Not feeling too welcome, my my dad, okay? With a, with a white white man, Charlie Hales, up at the front of the room eating fried chicken. I am not making that up, okay? I have that on video. And the guy in the front row who Hales is talking to is a two-time felon, okay? He, he, he was pitched twice and convicted and spent time in the state pen for rape against a child. And he's sitting there in the front row talking to Charlie Hales, okay, about how he want to ban the box. Okay, and Hales is saying, yeah, sure, I'll move you. Okay, I want your boat. Okay. This is exactly what we're talking about, Mark. Let, let, me, exactly let, me, let, me, let me steer this, let me steer yeah, this conversation. This, hold yeah, on, okay, Mark. Hold on, hold on, Mark. I got a question for you, Mark. Uh, it, be, the, way, the way I understand this poem, it, from what he said, uh, this eighth grader, he's saying that uh, 
white people, we don't notice our privilege because it's not something that we necessarily gain anything from. But we just we don't notice uh, we have a lack of injustice that is inflicted upon us. Uh, and again, I think this is uh, it, this completely overlooks the fact that anybody who gets swept up in the legal system, anybody at all, is is, is damaged. No matter what, no matter if you're found yeah. innocent, uh, if you are caught in this net of government, uh, you are you are made an example of. They try to squeeze every dollar out of you. And even if you're found innocent. In the end, it doesn't matter because the punishment is in the process. Uh, again, I was found innocent, yet I've paid thousands of dollars in legal fees. I, ha I, I was put on probation for a year. Uh, it, again, wrongfully arrested for, for breaking no laws whatsoever. Um, initially arrested for trespassing on a public sidewalk. It doesn't get more ridiculous than that. And then, then they tacked on displaying a weapon in a manner under circumstance in a time and place. And again, that was... Uh, that was um, uh, one in appeal, but still thousands of dollars, time off of work, stress, my name dragged through the mud. The punishment is in the process. It doesn't even matter if you win like I did. You're still screwed either way. So, so Mark, I, when it comes to white privilege, I'm just curious. Do you think that white people, or let's just use you for example, were you handed your success? Did, were you born at the top rung of the ladder here uh, it, simply because you're white? Absolutely, and I love it. Okay. <laughs> we'll be right back after this break, everyone. <laughs> no, no, but no, seriously, I love it. And how could you not love it? I mean, the idea is like, my dad was a total racist, total sexist, total bigot, total homophobe. But what he taught me was is never, ever feel guilty for being born as a white man in the most amazing country in the world. So I don't, uh, I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't hate it. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it. I'm saying that I love it. I mean, the idea that being white in the freest country on earth of all time is nothing short of an absolute privilege. It's absolutely wonderful. What I am saying is that I want people to try to understand that, granted, there are atrocities on all levels. There are problems on all ends of the spectrum. And there are people who commit crimes and who mess up and who completely destroy every single argument that we are trying to make on all sides of this issue simply because of their race or their gender or their sexual preference or whatever. What I am saying is that if you are a white male in the United States, you have a, an enormous level of privilege that is wonderful. Don't get me wrong. I don't think that anybody would trade it to their lives. I would never trade my privilege for anything else on this planet. But what I am saying is, is I recognize it. And what I am saying is, is that there is a lot of racism. Just like Dan said, just like I think all of us can understand. But the issue is, is that if you honestly believe as though somehow you don't have it, or somehow that you're not given something extra simply because of the way that people see you for the color of your skin, then you are grossly mistaken. <laughs> and I'm not saying that there's necessarily... Like, that we should feel guilty for it. I'm not saying, and that's exactly what something that my father instilled me. Never feel proud nor guilty for being the race that you are. But do feel blessed. You're blessed because of it. There is a term that is an absolute truth of called driving while black. And there are people who have been pulled over simply because of the color of their skin. There are many people who have been busted simply because of the fact that they are black versus white, or they're not white, and we have to recognize that. Now, whether or not you should feel guilty, and I agree with Dan on this, that you shouldn't be born to feel guilty simply because of a liberal or left-leaning media that suggests that because of the fact that you're white, that you have something to pay to society. I don't agree with that, but I do believe you have to understand, especially as a straight white male on that, that you have a lot of things or a lot of privileges given to you that a lot of people, that myself included, who are gay or who are not white, have a lot of things that are held against them. Now, I'm not saying I'm a victim. I'm not saying that I should have a, a situation just given to me, and I'm not trying to be subjective here. What I am saying is, is that when people are saying, we need to make America great again, what I think they're really trying to say is that they see power slipping away. They see gay people getting rights. They see black people getting the presidency. They see women having the opportunity of getting the presidency. And they simply don't like it. 
They don't like it because of the fact that what they're used to or they're accustomed to is something that they're not getting in the future. And I think that that's something that needs to be addressed. And that's the reason why I'm caught talking about this. So it's not that I don't necessarily feel guilty or that I believe that we should pay for any kind of sins that we've ever committed. What I am saying well, Black, is that Black Lives changing, Matter is though and we need to we Black, need to address that. Black Lives Matter is calling for reparations. So so do you disagree with that? Oh my god. Well did we wait a minute, wait a minute. Did Reagan not give reparations to the Japanese for FDR's mistakes when he put them into slavery? Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about Reagan. I'm, I'm, just, Reagan I'm, I'm asking you, Mark. Did Reagan not give amnesty to I, I, people? I, I, and Reagan is the I'm asking you, Mark. Okay, all right. Well, if you're going to bring up, if you're going to bring up Reagan, then let, let's at least make sure the record is correct. Because Reagan said that he was, he was, he made a mistake. That's it was his biggest regret. It passed in amnesty. But, but let's let's be clear. I just want to, I want to hit this one down here. Okay, do you? Okay, Agree with reparations that that black people have been systemically, uh, you know, oppressed and and because of this, they the ones today that are born today, they require reparations for stuff that was inflicted upon black people ages ago. No, I don't believe in reparations, but okay. yes, I do believe that they have systemically been discriminated okay. against. Okay, so so I just want to. Let's let's turn this uh, shift this conversation just a little bit here. Instead of disagreeing on where the problem is specifically, let's look at solutions that I think we can all agree on here. Uh, I think we can all agree that the war on drugs should end. It, it, first of all, Mark, a quick answer: yes or no? Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay, Dan, quick answer: yes, yes. or no? Okay. Yes. It should end. So we can. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about it in a broad stroke, but in general, he's. Especially these minor drug crimes, they got to go, man. Exactly. It's, 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 it's just a revolving door and it imprisons people for their entire life. So, really and I think we should applaud Obama for actually giving amnesty, or not amnesty, I'm sorry, but clemency to a lot of these people who have been busted. I have to, actually, them. Mark, I, I have to look carefully at who those people are and why it was granted. But I, and just because of some of the past stuff that he's done, I, I'm i suspicious to begin with. But I. I did see that article where he he get You're a racist. A yeah, you're a racist. <laughs> I I'm just I'm just suspicious of his unsu, unsuspicious of his of his motives and how it was implemented. It's obvious but, racism. Dan is a racist. Let's just call him for what he is. You're a racist, Dan. And, and we have to be sure that those people are not violent. <laughs> you know what if your bro- what if your brother or sister was killed by one of these people? You know, I mean, I hate to say it, but hey, white or black, it's, it's in jail and you're letting them go. You really have to start. They're let out. Of course, you know. I don't think that's reforming the system. Honestly, I don't think that giving clemency to your to your to your favorites is is the uh, is the answer. Okay, what well, that says is that if there are hundreds of thousands of these people, there are hundreds of thousands of these people. Obama's let out maybe two hundred. So I think I think I, 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 I want to be diligent about the fact that these people are not naive. Call me naive, okay? But I just been at this for long enough. I, 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 I think you're naive. I, I do think that this is. I think. I, I think it would really suck if any one of these people actually did commit a crime after this. But I do think he's been pretty diligent about the fact that he's like, listen, people, I'm letting you out here, and we're making a public relations thing out of you, so don't mess this thing up because it's going to really make me look bad. Okay. And I think also, most of these got, people also, are probably the people who are not doing it. All right, hold on, how's guys. How's the white guy in the next? How's the white guy in the next cell gonna look at that? Right, you know that, that's how I look at that. Uh, hold on, okay? hold on, it, one it, second. It, hold on, we're, we're, we're deviating. He's white. He has privilege. We're deviating here. <laughs> Let's go back. Okay, so so we we generally uh, generally agree here that the war on drugs should be ended. So next yeah. solution here, uh, I I I, I uh, ideologically oppose redistribution of wealth. And I think, as Dan pointed out, that this this system has has created uh, essentially institutionalized slavery, and it's it's created a, a system where ninety five percent of African Americans essentially line up to go vote Democrat just to, to enable the system that keeps them. Again, it, it's, it's this is a system of the war on poverty that has not that has not helped poverty, but has only ensured that people for generations stay in poverty. They can't get out because, again, I mentioned they can't go get a. Uh, you know, a new job that's higher paying because they'll make less overall money because it'll cut their welfare benefits. Uh, they can't work extra hours for 
the same reason. And and because of this, they again they go look for income under the table, find way other ways to make money. And again, this is all creating this problem where uh, there's a disproportionate violent crime rate in the African American community. So again, I argue that getting rid of the welfare state would be again. I don't see that happening with the way things are going. But would you both? Both agree that if we got rid of the war on drugs and we got rid of the welfare state, that this would cut a lot of the disproportionate effects that are happening to the black communities. Uh, first, Mark, what do you think? I think you're a racist, Mac, and you should just quit it while you're at it. Well, he, he is. Kid. No, no, <laughs> I mean, yeah. no, seriously. <laughs> no, the, he um, is because he's white. I, I'm not making that up. It's in the curriculum well, here. You, you, you obviously have black people people Mac, that people. you're white. I mean, really. He's no, true. no, no, no. He's he's like, like, you're right. <laughs> You're right. No, if you look at the curriculum, I can send you the stuff. I will when we're done with the that all white people are racist and black people can't be racist. It's being taught to the teachers inside the the, the, the public school system. Portland. I'll find the privilege. Power, you okay. Privilege. Okay. You look at privilege. Okay. No, 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 no. no. A, 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 I definitely agree when it comes to the drug war. The drug war disproportionately disproportionately affects black people and people of color, anybody of color, versus white well, people. Welfare state. Well, and welfare not, state. But let's go ahead and talk about the welfare state. And I think that this is one of the major things that you can affect, you know, when it comes to the preponderance of people who are not only pro-Trump or pro, that are, that are really against the whole system in general, which is exactly what Ron Paul said, is you cannot have a welfare state and open borders at the same time. And the nature of the United States, which is more of an open border or a, uh, a melting pot kind of culture, which is the idea that, you know, if you bring people in from all different cultures, yes, it makes the, the, the situation better. But if you give them an incentive to, quote, unquote, leech from the system or be uh, benefactors of a welfare state, then granted, you're going to have a negative effect or uh, a negative situation versus positive situation of bringing more people who are coming in for bringing the right results, like new, new technology, new new brain power, new culture. I mean, those, those are the kinds of things that we want in this country. So and I think, in addition to that, though, are, Mark, it, what, what, about, what about the incentivization of, of finding under-the-table work, uh, you know, uh, incentivizing people to make money through non-legitimate means that the welfare system itself does? What do you think about that? Well, I'm not, I, I'm, perhaps it is just for the welfare system, but it is also a situation where, yeah, you know, I mean, we have a very opportunistic society. I mean, you have a situation where in this country, and I'm not saying it's welfare state, I'm not saying it's capital, I'm not saying it's anything. It's just that, yeah, you know, I mean, you have a lot of opportunity in this country. And if employers can pay you, it's not even, when we're talking about welfare state, I'm not just talking about cash benefits or government cheese or food stamps. What I'm talking about is the idea in this country that if you can find a way to basically work the system, in other words, if you can find a way so that you don't have to pay taxes, if you don't have to adhere to enormous regulations or red tape, then of course you're going to. And that's just the path of least resistance. That's just the path of the situation where people want to succeed and are given an opportunity to break the laws because that's the easiest way to succeed. And of course, I don't know that that's called a welfare state, but I think that's called just a communist state that's where you're dealing, or, or a socialist state where you're dealing with, you know, tons of regulation. That's the reason why people ship jobs overseas. Yeah, I mean, it, you're, you're talking about like cr crony corporatism. You're, you're talking about crony corporatism yes, and yes, losing between government. And, that's a, that's a different issue. But but what I mean, what I'm specifically talking about here is the the if we were able to get rid of the welfare state, things that incentivize. Uh, people, whoever is on it, to, to make money because obviously they, they're not in appreciating the situation that they're in because they're still living in poverty. If you're if you're on welfare, you're getting food stamps, and that's your only source of income. You're still living essentially a miserable existence. You're not you're not enjoying life uh, because you're still poor. You're still in poverty, so you're still you still have the incentive to go out and go make extra money somewhere else. But you can't do it through legitimate means. Because if you do, you actually end up hurting yourself. You'll make less money overall. So it, I mean, when it comes to that, I think the welfare state actually does incentivize uh, you know, people who are on it to make money under the table somehow, make money through criminal 
criminal enterprises, make money through the war on drugs. I think it does drive people into the war on drugs, which again is another issue. If if we got rid of the war on drugs, I think that would be a huge step. If we got rid of the welfare state, I think it would incentivize people to actually go out, do things on their own, and we would see a lot less of these problems. Dan, what do you think? I think, well, I, I side with you, Mac, and I say, you know, the practical solution to that is, you know, you, with, with a caveat, and I guess the caveat is, and I forget who I was listening to that was saying this, it makes sense to me, is you need a very thin safety net under people, okay, because that allows them to take risks in society so that they know that they're never going to fall beneath they, they're not going to die in the street if they try and open up a new business. Okay, so I, I think there needs to be a yep. There needs to be some very low level, okay, of substance, okay, for people, uh, you know, subsidies, these kinds of things for people for people to uh, so that there's a very thin safety net. Now, I will say that the way you really begin to solve this problem is you do you you know you freeze the budget, okay, for these things for for welfare benefits. And then you just, you know, you continue to say, hey, we're going to have less of this and less of this and less of this. You know, each year we're going to reduce that budget by 1%, 2%, 3%. The same thing with the war on drugs, okay? You're just going to have less and less money that's available for that, okay? So we're going to have to pull back. And you put more and more program into rehab centers and treat it as a medical problem, which really, I, I think you are never going to stop people from doing drugs. You just aren't. They're, just, it, they're so prevalent in the society and, and it just contributes to that revolving door when these people who are dealers get collared by these cops and get into the system and, get, and learn all kinds of other behaviors and get raped and get, you know, all the problems that occur inside prison, you know, and we can get into, you know, is prison the right way to handle these people? But So the short answer to you yes, is yes, Matt. The way you do that is you slowly reduce it year by year. So but you never want to completely eliminate it because it says who we are as a society and it encourages people to take risks in a society. So th this is one of the reasons why I love having both of you guys on the show, because we, we disagree in different areas. I philosophically am opposed to all forms of redistribution of wealth. I don't think that anyone has a right to your sweat, blood, labor. I don't think that anyone has a right to reach into your pocket and take what's yours. Uh, so the the only reasons why I think that the, the federal government or any government whatsoever should be uh, you know, redistributing wealth or, or or pulling money out of your pocket in taxation is to pay for things that they are constitutionally given the right to do. Now, I think that the general welfare clause, for example, is has been reinterpreted to the point of where you know it's it's everyone is generally supposed to be on welfare according to the federal government, but um, that's not the way it was intended. You know, I, I personally. I could understand the argument being made for roads, hospitals, schools. I fundamentally, uh, you know, ideologically disagree with this. Uh, I don't believe in any need for a safety net. Uh, personally, I just think that that you you do not owe anything to anyone, and if if everyone is is either going to succeed on their own merit uh, or, or fail. Even if you do fail, there's going to be a safety net there. People aren't – again, we're the most charitable country in the world. When, when something happens around the world, we donate. We, we beat every other country out there in, in donations. Charity will always be there. That's the safety net. And I don't think that the federal government or even state or local governments have a real role in redistributing wealth. People in America have big hearts. We're willing to, to help our fellow man. And, and people will do that. And again, when you, when you have somebody like a, a government official uh, or a government agency that's supposed to fill that role to be the social safety net, you, you're basically saying it, that, uh, hey, Americans, you know, take a back seat. This is our responsibility. It's not yours anymore. And therefore, you see less involvement in your own community and you see less, less responsibility, personal responsibility to your neighbor. Again, you're not obligated, but you have a responsibility to, you know, to, to look out for your neighbor and to look out for your community. I don't think some policeman should come over and kick in your door if you didn't donate to, you know, whatever, the Red Cross, but I do think that you should do something for others. The only thing worth doing in this world is for someone else. Mark, I know you agree with Dan as far as a, a slight social safety net. Give us your thoughts on this. Well, one, cocaine's a hell of a drug, and that's why you see all these people who are doing a bunch of cocaine, and that's why you see a bunch of this drug war happening and the idea that we can pretty much try to regulate society in general. Two, let's just get back to that boy who's talking in eighth grade. I mean, obviously he's gay, 
and he needs to be like obviously talked about when it comes to the. That was a joke, you guys. Come on, it's a little funny. I said it. I said it. That boy is so gay. No, no. The idea is that he, he is somebody that is in eighth grade. I mean, come on now. I mean, before you even started growing pubes, were you going to be talking about the idea that everybody else has something that you don't? Come on. <laughs> everybody talks about that when they're a little kid. And so the idea is that. Or are we going to give all this credence to him? Are we going to give all this, like, no. respect to a kid? No. No. I mean, the kid is obviously privileged, and the kid doesn't understand what's really going on in life, and so I'm not going to sit there and hold anything against him. Mark, do you think this kid wrote the poem himself? Sure. I think that's your question. Do, do you think that he wrote the poem himself? I'll give him that. I, I don't give a kid. I, I don't give a kid. I mean, you do, do I think do I think Donald Trump's wife went ahead and said that stuff in the Republican National Convention? Sure, sure, I think <laughs> yeah. No, no, she she didn't steal it from Michelle Obama. I don't care. What I'm saying is, is that she, he's given credit for it. This is what happened, and the idea is is that he and the majority of people feel as though you know when, when you have this feeling of guilt when you, especially the rich in you know Hollywood who are basically saying you know we have some kind of a of an enormous um, thing to give back to society now if you honestly feel that that's when you're charitable but when you were required to give back via the government that's where what we call altruism you know if you ever study Ayn Rand who basically yeah. said altruism I, yeah, yeah Max you're not an Ayn Rand fan and I can tell you that right now I mean, no, I, no, no, I, very, I very, very much am yeah. an Ayn Rand fan Dan. no I, I know you are Mark, but you are Mark but Mac is not that's yeah. a, that's a, they, so, well, I think he is really coming out hey. conversation no I don't know uh, so, what so, I said was, was no, no, no. It, it, altruism, because I, you know, I know what you're talking about. I read, I read Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, and you know, the last hundred pages, she really starts to talk about the the altruism. You know, no one can ever be truly 100 percent altruist. Every single thing that you do, you do for selfish reasons. Even if you do it for a non selfish reason, like giving money, your money away to someone else. You you either do it because you want to see that person benefit, you want to see some good things happen to them, or you want to get that good feeling that you've done something good. But no one can ever be absolutely 100% altruism, altruist. So, unless you're forced. Unless you're forced by government. And that's the idea. And that's not altruism. What we're talking about when it comes to, what we're talking about when it comes to the welfare state is that, you know, people are using this concept of, you know, the more money that we spend, the more money, the more that we care. The more that we, you know, you know like if, if, you, if you choose to cut spending or if you don't want the welfare state, then you don't care about people. So it's the idea of forced altruism. Altruism and, and by, that's not, by that is not altruism. Own, even even if you do have forced altruism, that you're you're empowering the federal government to, to shake you upside down and receive your monies from uh, your your pennies from heaven. Uh, you know, and and all you do when even if we gave 100 percent of our wealth to, to the government, you know, it, who's to say how much is going to get stuck between their fi their fingers? There, you know, they're sticking. All lots. And, and again, lots. When, when you start God, to see a lot this, of it, and it's going to stink really bad, like Monica Lewinsky. Let me you, tell you. You see incredible. <laughs> you see incredible rises of, of poverty when you have when you have redistribution of wealth on that kind of scale. I talked about it last week with Mao Mao Zedong and and how the Communist Party was w removed all private property. And it, it, the, I mean, this is the we see this time and time again. When you see forced altruism, uh, you actually see again that the war on poverty is a perfect example it actually has made people uh in perpetual poverty created generational poverty and institutionalized slavery and these people just keep lining up 95 percent to uh, rates to to go vote democrat in order to secure their benefits but wouldn't you though if all of a sudden you were told that the opposite party and only of course only one party because there's no opportunity for a third party but if there's only the other one party but basically, it has historically been, and I'm not talking about Republicans, what I'm talking about are more on the end of conservatives, who are basically saying, no, we want to keep it the way that it has been. And that's really what I'm arguing when it comes to conservatism. I mean, the idea that the Republican Party today is brought with a bunch of conservatives, who are basically saying, no, I'm not necessarily saying that you shouldn't have a welfare state, but when you're talking to an entire group of people saying, 
we're going to go ahead and take away the benefit that you're being given, which is basically free money. Now, don't you think that there's a better way of trying to tell them that you should be aligning with this party or with this ideology? Okay, so, And that's so, the reason why I think the Republican Party is really messing up these cases, that they're not articulating a message that they should be when it comes to saying, hey, listen, we care about you, we care about your culture, we care about your ideology, but we're going about it the wrong way. And that's the reason why I think the Republican Party is, in fact, going about it the wrong way. Well, you know, one of the reasons why the Republican Party isn't advocating, uh, like, actually trying to do a whole lot of outreach, at least, you know, Donald Trump has been trying, I guess, but uh, he, I think he's going about it the wrong way. But, uh, it, you know, one of the reasons why they haven't is because no matter what they do, it's it's a lost cause. Again, 95% of, of African Americans vote Democrat. And yeah, you, you asked me, wouldn't you, if I, if I was a black man or, or woman, would I vote Democrat? No, I, I personally would have a fundamental problem voting for a party that was the party of the KKK, the party of Jim Crow, and now the party of institutionalized slavery. But hey, we got to cut to a commercial break, gang. Uh, before we go, I just want to put in your mind here, if you're white, you're racist, and never forget that. We'll be right back after this break. Don't go anywhere. Yes. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore. With the support of like minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright. You're listening to On the Move with Matt Worley III. All right, folks, we are back. I appreciate you all sticking with the, with us to the break here. This is uh, coming up on the third hour of the program, and uh, we have Dan Sandini on the line as well as Mark Delphine. Uh, Dan, I wanted you to take a moment here to give us an update on what's going on with the Bundy situation. This is uh, one of the, the reasons why we had you on the show. So uh, if you could just give us a heads up on what you, uh, what, what's going on with that. I don't, I don't track it day to day, but just for your listeners, you know, so as you know, Rick Santelli and, and uh, the Bundy that is in jail and, uh, and, and the folks that are, that are with him are within, say, 10 blocks of my house. So they are in a place called Justice Center in downtown Portland. And if ever there was a uh, uh, an oxymoron, it's the name of that building, Justice Center. Because <laughs> it, is the la- it really is. It's terrible. It, it is terrible. It is a single building for one-stop jail, one-stop uh, imprisonment and, and, uh, and the um, prison state. And you go in that place and you disappear. It is the modern-day version of of the back steel. And I'll, uh, you know, I'll give you an example of how, of how that happens. But a friend of mine, uh, Mike Strickland, was, I don't really talk about the case, but I'll, I'll talk about the stuff that's in the newspapers, okay? But, you know, he, he goes down, feels in jeopardy of his life, and pulls out a weapon, okay? And the cops charge him with, uh, I forget what it is. This is the equivalent of the brandishing thing, okay, here, here in Portland. It's, uh, uh, in any case, they charge him with a couple of misdemeanors, and they let him go that night. 
Well, overnight, the prosecuting attorney finds out who he is, and he's a nemesis of the left and a nemesis of the gun grabbers here in the state of Oregon. And the DA the next morning slaps on three separate felonies and sets, and sets his bail at $250,000 and throws him in jail without a criminal record. Never had a criminal record before. So you talk about people uh, being prejudiced against so-called right-wing nuts jobs. Okay, that's a perfect example of how someone is being made an example of. And so the buddies, the last I heard was um, a guy named Gavin Stein, who if you haven't checked him out yet, you really need to check out Gavin Stein for the Liberty. I know you've had him on before, Mac. He's a great guy, but Gavin uh, has been coming on Facebook and giving live updates, which I've been watching, okay? Mm -hmm. And the judge, in this case, Judge Brown, there are a couple of different things that have gone on uh, uh, inside of the jail, and that said, money has been thrown down a set of stairs. I believe it 100% that uh, a sheriff's deputy in the inside of that place, if you go in there, Mac, if you go in there, I haven't been in there to visit people before, you are treated like a criminal. You really are treated like a criminal. I mean, it, there's not a smile on the face, not a, not a, not, I, I, mean, I can see that it's not some big happy experience. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not going to a carnival here, okay? Yeah. But but there's no reason not to te not to treat the people the the people with a capital P okay that you took an oath to defend and protect okay that, that to treat those people respectably when they come into that jail okay we are paying your salary people but in any case they had thrown him down out of stairs he wanted and they refused and they uh, had given him the punishment for doing that. Without a, without a trial. Apparently, they have these mock trials inside the place, okay, where he's found guilty of additional crimes on the inside, okay, and is thrown into solitary confinement and is now not being allowed to defend himself in the courtroom. And in the jury selection process, they identified people who had relationships with the district attorney, that they had worked for them or worked at the same firm with them, and the judge said no. We are not going to allow that as a question to disallow these people from being on the jury. I think that's a pile of crap. How are you ever going to get a fair trial if the jury is already being stacked with people that know the district attorney and respect him and blah, blah, blah? Okay? But that's a bunch of crap. You, you have to have total strangers. You have to at least begin from total strangers, from the two attorneys that are practicing in front of you. So, so they have been denied bail. Okay, so they've been shoved in there. In the case of Rick Santilli, all he did was go in to report on what was going on inside the wildlife refuge. Uh, refuge okay? and, and here's my point on this whole thing. And, and now they, and they, and they killed uh, Finnegan. Okay, and they, they actually, the FBI actually killed him, and then they lied about who pulled their guns out. I mean, it's, it's just a perfect example. What's going on inside of Justice Center is just a perfect example. And all the charges that were thrown on top of Mike Strickland the next day when they took him away from us and threw him in jail at $250,000, I mean, for Mike Strickland to come up with $250,000, I mean, you might as well say no bail, okay? There's no way that guy's got up a quarter million dollars, and she knows it, okay? She knows it. That judge knows it. He's not a dangerous person. He's never committed a dangerous crime. All he did was, I mean, you can see the video that takes his gun out, okay? What are the circumstances from which he took the gun out? You don't know that. Bad judge, you weren't there, and you haven't seen all the evidence, okay? So you're finding him guilty before you're even having a trial on the guy. And the police are just an example about that. And Seneca uh, uh, well, boy, Seneca paid the ultimate price, okay, for these people who created a showdown that never had to create a showdown. And when you look at the real crimes that are being committed in society, it just, it just makes me so angry to see what they are doing to these people who uh, set up shop inside the wild, what they call a wildlife preserve which is actually just land that they want to steal away from the ranchers so they can give it to folks who, who want to export the mineral, minerals and the mineral rights to that place overseas, okay? That's exactly what's going on down there, okay? So the government is against the people in that particular situation, and no one is speaking out about it. No one notices how this system abuses our rights until you know and love somebody that's abused by it or you get sucked in yourself. And, and those numbers of people are growing. I, I warn you, district attorneys, police officers, and you know, police are just following orders, okay? But you, a warning to you, okay, that, the, that on a, a grassroots level, no matter what walk of society that you come through right now, you are looking at what's going on with the prison system, and you are saying, hey, look, 
This is a gross character mis- of uh, injustice that's going on against the people, and that we have to really wipe the board clean in this in this case. I don't know how you begin to solve the problem, but in the case of Bundy's, they are going to jail again. Okay, there's no way they're going to be found innocent. I guarantee you. Not the way things are going right now. It, it, time, time and time again, we're seeing that abuse of the prisoners until they react. Okay, and then they get thrown in solitary confinement before their trial, so they're unprepared for trial. They won't allow their lawyers to visit them, okay, which is a fundamental right under the Constitution. They're stacking the juries against these people, using the system. The district attorneys that know the judges that owe favors to them, it's all stacked in favor of the state. The rules are all stacked against the people and in favor of the, of the prosecuting attorney in these cases. And they're using it against nonviolent criminals to prove a political point. And in the case of the Bundys, in the case of Mike Strickland, uh, they did in the case of you, Mac. And, and Mac, you know, you should talk about that a little bit this one because I, I am, do not have the strength of character. I would have folded like a cheap card table with those people. Okay? And I said to myself, look, I'll plead guilty to some misdemeanor. And I, I would have. I would have. I'll plead guilty to some misdemeanor in 10 years down the road. I'll get it. I'll get it um, wiped off my record. You know, I mean, I'll just live with it until then. But, you know, you've got to work for a living. I mean, you've got to clear your name. And the, and the, and uh, I, I really, I think that you, you fought a great battle, and that's not fully been told yet, Mac. That's going to be told for years to come as an example of how people can stand up to the system and, and win. But, you know, you need backing on, on, uh, in order to do that. So, well, well, let, let, me, let me just say, though, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm white, and, and the buddies, you know, they're, tr- they're, 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 they're being treated this way because they're black, right, Dan? They're black. Yeah. Mike, too. Yeah, Mike, yeah. too. I think he's got some black. Oh, Wait, you're yeah. white, man? No yeah. way. Are yeah. you? Like, wait a minute. I yeah. thought I was talking to a black man this whole oh, time. Oh, see, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's, that happens all the time to me. I don't know why, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, actually, oddly enough, the Bundys, they, they're white. You know, this white privilege thing, it didn't apply to them, and it didn't apply to me, and it didn't apply to Mike Strickland. Uh, the the issue here, and the way you can really go test if you have white privilege, is just to go, you know, conduct a protest against some government official or building. Hell, you can easily just go go walk up to a police station and stand on the public sidewalk and start, start recording the building and see how much white privilege takes you, how far that... That'll take you. Uh, you know, it, it's it's this is happening all over the country, and, and the issue here is again, uh, they're they're it's the machine. The, the once the machine targets you, you are you're in the sights, and it doesn't matter. You know, the, it does not have feelings. It does not care. It has no remorse. It is like like the Terminator. It's like Skynet. Ah, it does just not dance care. Like Arnold. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, no, it, it has feelings. It has feelings of vengeance against. Enemies exactly, and, and and pulling political punches for its for its, for politicians that, that put you in in powerful positions. The you know the judges and the district attorneys definitely have feelings. Uh, I've seen it in their eyes when they look at you. I've got you exactly where I want you. It's the feeling when they look at you. Okay, like I wish I had you in here because I, I can't do it to you. Okay, I can't do it to you, so I'm going to do it to your friend. Mm-hmm. That, that's basically that's basically these are. These people are thugs. Can I say that? Yeah. Well, I'm going to say that. The district attorney is a thug. She's a female white thug in a suit. Okay? I can tell you that right You're now. You're a racist and a sexist, Dan. You're a racist and a sexist. <laughs> I am. <laughs> so, so, Mark. Um, By definition, I'm one. <laughs> no, Mark, have you been following this this whole Bundy situation? Is this something that you pay? Uh, a little to? bit. And to me, it's the kind of thing where when you're talking about not only I'm in a domain, but you're talking about a situation. I mean, the thing is, is that the, the left, the liberal left, should have really taken um, a hold of this and said that we are on these guys' side. I mean, this is something that where they really missed a big opportunity where liberals and conservatives could come together. That being said, it is the kind of thing that this is something where it's basically blowback. I mean, when you're looking at a situation where, you know, this is an opportunity where... You, know, you can look at, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes of, uh, you know, some southern rednecks who are like, wow, you know, we can go ahead and attack them and get some political press support. They're going to take advantage of it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that there's anything right about that. What I am saying is that I understand that this is how politics works. It sucked. It's horrible. It shouldn't have happened this way. 
Um, I disagree with it, but I understand that this is how, and exactly to Dan's point, that this is the district attorney trying to win some political points and score an easy dunk when it comes to, you know, some, some serious press. Um, that being said, I, I think you guys are grossly mistaken when it comes to, oh, you know, this is it. This this is, this is an example that there isn't any white privilege. That's ridiculous to me. That this, this is a, this is an apples and oranges case. This is this is a situation where you're dealing with you know a, a completely different situation when you're talking about the drug war, where you know I mean hundreds of thousands of innocent uh, black lives or people of color who were discriminated against simply because of the fact that drugs that are disproportionately affecting the black community are punished a hundred times worse than that are affected in the white community versus uh, a very singular case of, you know, absolutely horrible government tactics, which I think we can all agree was horrible against the Bundy. So I'm not saying that the Bundy were treated horribly and that this is a bad situation. But what I'm saying is that this isn't one of those examples that you can throw out and say, see, there isn't any white privilege. This is bad government. This isn't an example that there isn't white privilege. Oh, hold on. So, so <laughs> this, this sounds like one of those, those same things that, you know, it's the, it's the hypocrisy here. And I just want to point this out because uh, people, Black Lives Matter, they can say, oh, you know, here's an example of, of white privilege because I am being discriminated against as a black man. Here's my everyday occurrence. This is something that happened to me, but I as a white man can't say this is something that happened to me when it's turned around and I'm I'm targeted by the same Leviathan that, that you're targeted the, by as, what, as a black man. Was the district attorney black? Were, were there a whole group of people black who were this, prosecuting this? This is, this is no, my this point. Is this, is, this, is, this is my exact this, point. Is that it doesn't, the system doesn't care what color your skin is. The system is, is a seek and destroy once you're in the target, that's it. Yes, I agree with that, Mac. What I'm saying is that it's easy. What we're talking about is low-hanging fruit. What we're talking about is when you can easily bust people for easy crimes, i.e. drugs, that are, you know, easily winning points with the prosecution so that they can put notches on their belt and win for re-election, then naturally they're going to go after a certain group of people who are easy prosecuted. So, so, Mark, that, in do, my opinion, is obvious. Mark, I don't know how you could disagree with that. Do, do they you are contend clearly that, not necessary. Do, do you what? contend that that uh, that black people are that more black people are arrested for drug offenses than than any other demographic? I I don't know the stats on it for sure, but I would think that yes, they are. Okay, because I, I remember we had a conversation about this not too long ago, and you were saying, you know, pe white people just aren't being picked up for drug-related offenses. I'm looking at the stats right now. Uh, so uh, white people consist of 550. This is in uh, 2014. This is these uh, state and federal prisoners in the U.S. Uh, that were convicted. This is categorized by race, ethnicity, gender. And you're talking numbers, not necessarily percentage. Right? Exactly. Yeah, but but the, the point that okay. I was making the last time we spoke about this was that th this is happening, and it, it, white people are being arrested. Well, it, there's a disproportionate uh, impact on the black community, and again, I argue that it has a lot to do with the war on drugs and the welfare system, and incentivizing African Americans to actually get involved in the war in in the drug. Yes, war which is systemic racism, which I don't understand why you can disagree with me on that. It's systemic. Now, whether or not we agree with the idea of why it's systemic, or whether or not—I mean, we both agree that this is. Uh, I, I don't believe this has anything to do with affecting a minority race. Your contention is that this has to do with race. Uh, my contention is that this has to do with the war on drugs and the welfare state. None of this has anything to do, in my perspective, with race. Now, different races are being disproportionately affected, but again, I argue that it's a combination of the factor. Again, uh, for some reason, uh, African Americans are disproportionately proportionately in low income housing low income housing is where there is a a, a a disproportionate amount of crime and again black people are committing more violent crimes than any other demographic punching way way above their weight eight to ten times higher more violent crime rates than whites and hispanics combined so uh, again I, this, you're a racist treatment saying that Matt. i guess i guess so it's my white privilege talking <laughs> or wait a minute it might not be i don't i get confused sometimes how that works sometimes 
Sometimes I'm allowed to talk about it. Sometimes I'm not. White privilege is so confusing nowadays. But You're anyway. not when it hurts the argument. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like liar, liar. You know, the he's, problem. He's, he, Until you fix the problem, you've got to go where you find the crime. I, I mean, that's, exactly. You know, you know, it's, right? You got to go where you find it. You know, so it's one thing to say, okay, these things are no longer, you know, these things are no longer against the law. I object, you Your Honor. To, because it's really damaging to my case. I think, Dan, I think Dan hit the nail on the head right there. It's that if, if, if crime, if police officers, if prosecutors realize where they can get easy bust is in a community that is easy. Oh, you still there? For portion of the bust and, and, and affects um, the black community or whether it be because of the fact that they're poor and they're easy and they have no... Um, you know, uh, representation, or because of the fact that the laws are disproportionately affecting a particular community because of the nature of the drug, which does happen to be more prevalent among a black community versus the white community, it's irrelevant. I think Dan hit the nail on the head. It's that it's well, easy, see, I easy think, target. And I, and I think that here's the problem. When you begin doing things like, okay, the Black Lives Matter folks are saying it's okay to kill cops, and you've got people like the Bundys that are saying, that are calling them Negroes, okay? And neither one of those things helps the situation, which is them identifying the common enemy. Now, I think that, that when you're going to really no, change ignorance. the country... It's just pure ignorance. Okay, uh, hold, hold, hold on one second. You know, well, let, me, let me get this, these stats out real if fast, If you can okay. both come together, okay, if you, can both, if you get both of those groups, people together, to focus on who the real enemy is, and I think there are a list of concrete things, just like we were talking about with the Walters Day, in the justice system that everybody could agree on to do. And that's the thing. There's no IG. Think about this, Mark. Think about this, Mac. There's no IG function that's really functional inside of the justice system that looks at a prosecuting attorney and says, hey, look, you have kept, you have deliberately withheld exonerating evidence inside these files that you have not given to the defense, which happens all the time. It's completely into the law. I had that the police extremely hard to do the, the all police time. department for me that they, okay. they withheld my video for over a year and and, and, yes. and we know based on the evidence here based on the timestamp from the video we know that they had it within 3 hours of my arrest yet they withheld it saying they couldn't access it for over a year. Uh, Dan, you're, you're absolutely right. As far as, I just want to get back here real quick to, to these stats here. As far as the, the amount of white non-Latinos that, that have been arrested for drug offenses, 559,732. So 559,732 white people. Black people, 539,500. So there are uh, approximately what, what 20 uh, what crime, is, what crime? drug can Convictions. We're, so we're talking about uh, drug convictions, and Mac, so when you're even, talking about white people being 65 percent of the population and black people being 13 percent of the population, you have to see that it's clearly a disproportionate number. Of I people completely who are agree, black but people. but where we where we differ right. in opinion here is that I contend that, that this has to do with the welfare state creating an institutionalized poverty within it, generations of of blacks, and and what it's doing is incentivizing them to get. In to the drug game because they can't make any additional money yes. for legitimate means. Okay, so we all agree on this, but what I'm saying is... What if we fail? Okay. So, so, so this, this is not... If we all I agree on this... This is not institutional racism. Uh, uh, hold on, hold on. If we all agree on this, how is talking about white privilege helping that situation at all? How How is how is not identifying the real problem, which is the welfare state and the war on drugs, how is shifting the conversation to white privilege, how does that do anything? Thing at all to help the problem, and how does it not cause what we're seeing now? Racial let me, division let me, let me and the assassination that. of police. Go ahead, Mark. Tell okay, me. okay. I'm, I, listen, I don't condone assassination of police, but I don't want to talk about that for one quick second. I'll, I'll shelve that. I'm not saying it's not relevant, but I'm saying I want to talk about this for a second. Dan, to Dan's point, is that there absolutely is a systemic issue when you're talking about you know, police being shot, police being targeted, you know, I mean, there is a problem with that. But when you're talking about an issue when it comes to the black community, when there are, they are seriously seeing the situation as being, you know, a government going after them, you were obviously having a situation where you have systemic problems, you have an issue where you know, if you're looking at if you're looking at the welfare state, and you're saying, okay, this is this is an issue where the government is disproportionately.
disproportionately affecting the black community. You were obviously saying something to the effect that, you know, there, there's, there's some kind of an intention here. Am I right? I mean, there's, there's an issue where it's like, look, we, we are trying to, I'm not saying segregate, but trying to keep something down. And so when you're dealing with, when it comes to the issue of, you know, the black community itself and how it sees itself in being, going from being brought here to being, you know, having Jim Crow laws to having drug wars against them to having, you know, an issue where you're looking at police brutality being disproportionately affecting a particular community. You have got to see how, when you're being raised in this situation, this is what they're seeing every day. They're feeling this every day. They're seeing this every day that this is something that people are against them. And when the one thing that really got me the most is when I started hearing black parents saying, teaching their kids, when you were approached by a police officer, this is how you should respond. That to me said something that I would never ever been addressed by my parents, nor have I ever heard any of my white friends ever being addressed by. When a police officer approaches you, this is how you should behave. What does that tell you? There's something systemic here. My parents like, taught me. Yeah, my parents taught me what to what to do when police. And in fact, yeah. I, you know, I disagree with what my parents taught me. They said, you know, do everything a police officer tells you to do. They're on your side. I, I agree. I, agree yeah. with it. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, I believe you. Same same background. Yeah. So I don't same know what thing. your parents taught you, Mark, but but my mine actually did respect authority. You know, respect the police. Do what they tell you to do. They're on your side. If you're ever lost and you need some help, find a police officer. They'll help you out. Like this is this is what I was taught. But again, it's that's not the case. I mean, not and again, I'm not anti police. I am absolutely pro oath keeping peace officers. But the bottom line is, some of these guys out there are tr trying to get collar. Some of these guys are just try. Some of these guys are out there just trying to do their job. There, there are bad apples in the bunch, and sometimes you're going to run into them. You know, and, and, all and kinds of walks of life. That's just yeah. it, it's even a holes. There's people who are just a holes that are just out to make the, there's you know, ice make cream. There's look ice cream truck drivers that. that that are great people, and there's ice cream truck drivers that are a-holes. It's in every career, every right. walk of life. And, right. and the bottom line, well, when it comes to... Ice cream truck drivers are not given a badge and an authority to kill. Yeah, yeah. but they can control the ice cream, man. That's freaking important. <laughs> Look, man, if, if, you, if you can't get your ice cream, if you're chasing these, these ice cream trucks down the street, you know, maybe this is just a problem I have, but uh, I don't know. I'm just saying. Anyways, so back to these numbers. I just want to point out, Mark, uh, you can say that, you know, that there's a disproportionate impact on minorities. Uh, and yeah, the African American population consists of 13% of the population, and there are only 20,000 less convictions of, of black Americans than white Americans for drug related offenses. But let's point out the fact that these are. Uh, they're, they're far disproportionate above their, their, their ratio. This works against your own argument. They're violating dr uh, drug laws at a disproportionate rate than any other, uh, any other demographic. So they uh, are the no, 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 no. Let, let, me, let me see this real quick. When it comes to being a minority, and I will go ahead and just throw myself under the bus here. As a gay man, I grew up in a gay community that did a, sh I mean, a ton of drugs. I mean, I, I got involved in cocaine. I knew a, a lot of my friends who got involved in meth. I had a, you know, I was a pothead. Oh. Is that, I mean, I'm, I, I would even consider myself to be an alcoholic. I mean, the idea is that when you're talking about a minority community, minority communities in general, by and large, try to alleviate themselves from this, the, from society in general through drugs. I think there's a, a preponderance of drug use in minority communities specifically because of the fact that they identify with a minority community. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should feel guilty of being white but I, or being straight or being whatever. What I'm saying is, is that people who are of a minority community tend to try to absence themselves from society vis-a-vis -a, -vis a uh, mind-altering situation, namely alcohol, pot, coke, any of those types of drugs, crack, cocaine, any of those types of situations. So, so when you're dealing, when it comes to the the, the the 
the absolute most dominant or the most prevalent minority in this country, which is the black community, of course, I think it's natural that they're going to have the most amount of drug use, which is the reason why I think you started to see a big drug war being waged on people because it's like, oh, easy target. Again, That's I, 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 can, I, I mean, I can understand your point, and, and I agree that there's probably some some people in in that community that, that are affected in the way you're talking about. But my contention is that it's disproportional, not because, you know, that they're, they're, you know, in poverty and they, they want to, that they, they want to self-medicate or whatever, you know, along those lines. My contention is that there is self-incentive to go into the war on, or to, sorry, to go into the drug game because they can't make money through legitimate means because they'll end up getting less welfare overall. And, and again, when there is incentive, you get more of it. And, and that's what we see here. This system itself incentivizes African Americans who are disproportionately on welfare when compared to every other demographic. African Americans are, are, are stuck in institutionalized slavery at a disproportional rate, and it's incentivizing them to get into the war on drugs. And that is why they're disproportionately involved and, and arrested and convicted for drug-related offenses. And again, that's why they have a, a higher violent crime rate. That's why police are, are, are more inclined to be in contact with an African-American male than, than any other demographic. And that's also why police are more likely to be killed by an African-American male than any other demographic. And that's also why, if you're black, you're more likely to be killed by another black than any other demographic. And they're swinging way above their weight when it comes to, to not only just murder rates in general, but murder rates in, within their own community in general. So, it, Again, it, it, we basically disagree on on what to focus on. My focus here is the war on drugs and the welfare state, which incentivizes people to go into the in, into the drug game. Y you're talking about white privilege, and I feel like it obfuscates and confuses the real issues that we should be talking about that are actually impacting uh, negatively these minority communities. But uh, you know, I guess we're just going to have to agree, uh, agree to disagree on this. But I want to shift our focus. Gates, that's a big word. I can't understand that. You're obviously right. <laughs> I guess. So so yep, let's there go. Let, let's shift here. I want to I want to shift here and, and talk about uh, something that's near and dear to to my heart here, and that's Donald friggin' Trump. I, I just love this <laughs> man. I mean, oh, oh wait, this yeah, I, yeah, this is where we get to like rip you apart. Yes. But, so oh. so when we come back from this break, folks, we're gonna talk about Donald Trump, and we're gonna talk about this campaign. I am never Trumper. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, that. Uh, Mark is also a never Trumper as well, but I think he's also a little, you're, you're pro -Hillary. A little he's a little pro Hillary, if I'm not mistaken. Am I, am I right about that, Mark? You're you're totally incorrect, you racist. Oh, oh, okay. Well, well I'll let you set the record straight. I think he's a Gary Johnson fan. I gotta hear this. Uh, uh, and, and, and Dan is a huge drinking the the Donald Trump Kool Aid kind of guy. He's all about. He's that. obviously drunk. On Wait, I'm gonna pour a glass while we're on break. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so we'll be right back after this break, folks. You don't want to go anywhere. Uh, it's going to be hilarious what's coming up next. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, pledging my life my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me God. Join us at oathkeepers.org. Support on the move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, Worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign.
Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright. You're listening to On the Move with Matt Worley III. All right, we're back. So, if you're just joining the program, I have Dan Sandini of the Daylight Disinfectant. That's daylightdisinfectant.com or youtube.com slash daylightdisinfectant. He's also on Twitter. If you want to message him on the show, it's uh, at Daylight Dis. I know everything about Dan's uh, social media because I've had him on the show about a million times. Uh, a million times. I love it every time. Thanks for having me oh, on. Oh, man, I love having you on. And we got Mark Delphi on the show. Mark, what's your social media so people can uh, get a hold of you if they want during the show or after? Hey. <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody, uh, go to Hey if you want to get a hold of Do you know what a, you know what a gay cow eats? <laughs> Hey, I'm guessing. Hey, there we you go. You know what a lesbian cow eats? What's that? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay. All right. So let's talk Donald Trump. Now let me start out with, with Dan, who is a, a supporter of Donald Trump. Um, and I just, Dan, how do you feel Good about the, the momentum of the campaign and Donald Trump himself? What, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think he's going to win? I, it's going to be close, guys. It's going to be close. I mean, I was just looking at the numbers before we got on the air today on a real, real clear politics. And Hillary's ahead in almost every poll. But the problem is yep. that Trump is gaining. And September is, uh, September is, this is it. This is do or die this month. And I, a lot of the work I do is very involved in both of the campaigns. And there's just going to be a, a shit ton of words we can use on the air, a shit ton of expenditures over the next month. Okay, in terms of Hillary's going to be carpet bombing to try and maintain the lead that she has in swing states. And, and Trump is just going to be, these rallies are getting crazy. So the short answer to your question is, I think that, that Trump has a chance to carry the momentum, and he's doing all the right things to begin to have sort of mainstreamers begin to pay attention that this guy isn't as, as he isn't the booty man that they point him out to be, so I try to paint that. So when you're meeting over in Scotland and then you're meeting down in Mexico and then you've got a room full of black people cheering you on in downtown Detroit, all of a sudden Hillary's campaign is looking around going, we are, we are reacting. We're no longer proactive in attacking this guy. We're reacting. And so I think you're going to see those numbers. And as a matter of fact, that's the headline story right now on um, Politico is the fact that those numbers are waning. You know, he wins in some national polls. He definitely does not win in the electoral polls. So, Dan, all the counts on election day. Why do, you, why do you support Trump? Why are you voting for, for well, Mr. Trump? It, I mean, it's, it's a recognition. It's a recognition. It's, look, guys, is Donald Trump my favorite person in the world? No. He's bombastic. Uh, he's, you know, he's, um, he, he's a he You know, he, he just, you know, I mean, he, he rubs people people the wrong way. I personally look past who he is as his limitations as a person, and I think you can look at him as being a successful business person. I think you can look at him as a person who knows how to make a business work and how to give people jobs. And I believe that he can apply that recognition of what certain people's uh, uh, qualifications are in order to put them in positions where they're going to help the country. I think that that's, that's so what you're going to see under Donald Trump is very similar to what you saw with Reagan. Reagan, Reagan's corporation, he hired all kinds of people that were smarter than him. For example, for example, who did Ronald Reagan pick as a, as a chief economist? He picked, he picked Milt Friedman. You're going to see similar, you're going to see similar choices, okay, in terms of people that, he, that, uh, that Donald Trump picks. Donald Trump's going to pick Milton Friedman? Oh my gosh! He's gonna dig no, him up. No, Will Friedman's dead. Yeah. Oh, that, no, could you? Thomas, you know what? You know what? Dan, Dan, Dan said that he's gonna pick people that are smarter than than Donald Trump. Donald Trump will pick people that are smarter than. So let me just say, Dan, are you contending that dead Milton Friedman is smarter than living Donald Trump? No, oh. no, I'm I am. Milton Friedman is dead. Milton Friedman is dead. Hey, but people who studied under Friedman are not. Okay, all right. So, like, so, Thomas so like Thomas Sowell, uh, for example. I'm okay. just giving you crap. If you want to see some... Uh, all right, hold on. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just giving you crap, Dan. So, so Mark... Uh, I know. Let, let me uh, give you a moment to retort. Why do you dislike Donald Trump? Uh, this is about the only time that I just cannot understand Dan Tendini. You know, I love this guy to death. I... 
have been friends with Dan Tandini for over a decade now. And yet I just, I, I, I can't possibly fathom the understanding that somebody <laughs> supports a guy who has bankrupted a casino and then has said oh. that this is a good businessman. I mean, when you bankrupt a casino, the whole intention of a casino is to take money from people, plus the fact of you bankrupted vodka, you bankrupted a university, <laughs> you bankrupted stakes. All of these things are fully intended on taking people's money for profit. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with taking people's money for profit, but when you can't even do it correctly and successfully, it clearly says to me that you're not a good businessman. Not to mention the fact that he had a ghostwriter for his particular book that was such a success, and yet this ghostwriter clearly attested that this man is a complete fraud. Okay, so, it is so, a fraud. so on policy, it is total fraud, uh, and it had nothing to do with any success except the fact that he had a dad who gave him a ton of money. It was, oh, just, it was just an, it was an like infinitesimal. The concept behind Donald Trump Mark. is uh, that hold, a, hold on, Mark. Hold, was, hold on. No, let me it was, just really it, quickly finish. Okay. This is a man that has given thousands of dollars to Hillary Clinton. Thousands of dollars to the Clinton campaign. The Clintons attended his wedding. This is a man who believes in universal health care, who, who did believe at one point in amnesty and then doesn't and then does it again and doesn't, who then says he's for the drug war but is against it, who's for gay marriage but is against it, who is pro-choice but is against pro-life who said, I mean, he's a flip-flopper, and the main argument that everybody has against Hillary Clinton is that she's a liar, that she can't stick to one principle. She completely flip-flops. And this is a man who's given thousands of his own dollars to this woman. There's nothing you can say about Hillary Clinton that you can't say about Donald Trump. And the mere fact that anybody is supporting this man is purely on party lines. And the man isn't even really a Republican. So there's no way that anybody can tell me that this is a man that's worthy of political success when he's had zero political exposure or experience in his entire life. Okay, so, so it's, you know, I want to comment here. I want to retort here on what both of you guys are saying. Uh, Mark, I think you made an excellent point. He was given a million-dollar loan, just an infinitesimal million-dollar loan from his father. Uh, just, you know, everyone, everyone has that. Oh, especially if you're white, you got white privilege. You, you could just get get your million-dollar loan loans from your daddy war bucks is out there uh but then your 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 point that he's a successful business person i i have a real problem with the fact that it, that first of all he's admitted to paying bribing politicians for business related favors uh, again i don't i don't really consider any of your success that you build off the backs of taxpayers or or off the backs of using corrupt government officials to to get your way really a success uh and again he has been bankrupt several times uh, again if if we're talking about his, his business life I, I think it's better just to not talk about that because there's more problems wrong with that than than there are real issues but let's talk about him being a deeply flawed ideological candidate and dan just a quick a quick answer on this do you i would imagine you agree that he's deeply flawed ideologically correct no i think they're actually deeply flawed deeply flawed to me is someone who's in the wrong place and is going in the wrong direction. That's, that's deeply flawed. Okay, then you've got a problem. You've got a huge problem. But I think what you're doing is you're catching Donald Trump at a snapshot in time, which we all are as individuals. I mean, I was a big no nuker liberal back in high school. This was okay? just, the, what, what I'm evolved. talking about people now. The, his, he just donated to, to Hillary Clinton, but right before this election season, and he said that he should make a really great president. And this election season, during the debates, he admitted to bribing politicians to get business-related favors. This isn't a snapshot in time unless we can't use this current time as a snapshot. I mean, Well, I you have to look today. at, Matt, and I don't know the specifics of what his quote-unquote bribe was, but he's probably speaking in general terms. He, he said, he uh, to, hold on, he said, yeah. when you give these politicians donations, they'll do whatever right. the hell you want them to do. And, and that's and correct. He he said yes when uh, I think it was Brett Baer uh, it was asking him about getting business uh, getting business related favors for donations to politicians. He said hell yeah I do. And th this is this is all, all part of it. again that's crony corporatism. That's not free market. And I, I believe that he is ideologically headed in the wrong direction. He's talking about increasing. No, I think he wants to reform that system. I think it's that that Trump looked at the, looked at the reality of the situation that he was under. And I mean. It, to be a reality denier helps nobody. 
and and really, Max, you have to look at what's legal and what's not legal. And what's legal is astounding to me. And the Supreme Court just decided this case on the governor of Virginia, okay, who received a hundred thousand dollar payment as a gift. Who, who's and the reality and, denier here, though, I, Dan? I just I got to point out here because people keep comparing Ronald. Uh, uh, Donald Trump to Ronald Reagan and saying how how they're so similar and how how much they would have uh, agreed with each other and it's just it's absolutely verifiably not true especially here I got a clip from President Reagan talking about tariffs and protectionism and how he was completely against it he referred to it as destructionism here's a clip it's loading sorry some of it suggesting we should protect American companies from foreign competition. I don't believe the American people are afraid of competition. That was made clear to me when I visited a Harley Davidson plant recently. It's a great story. Let me tell you about it. Not that long ago, it was being said that Harley Davidson, America's preeminent manufacturer of motorcycles, couldn't keep up. That the company was running out of gas and sputtering to a stop. Well, one of the worst mistakes anybody can make to bet against Americans. At Harley Davidson, workers and management got together and decided not only to compete, but to win. With unity of purpose and a commitment to excellence, they cut the hours of work needed to make a motorcycle by one third. Their inventory was reduced by two thirds. And they tripled the number of defect free machines they shipped. Productivity was improved, prices were kept under control. On some bikes, they even lowered prices. While doing all this, they expanded their product line from three models 10 years ago to 24 this year. Today, Harley-Davidson is once again a leader in developing new motorcycle technology. They are now selling more and more bikes on virtually every continent of the earth. In fact, they are the only major motorcycle manufacturer in the world to have increased production last year. And yes, they have all so increased exports. These Americans, confident in themselves and their product, have asked that their special tariff be removed so that they can meet their competition head on. Current law provides companies like Harley Davidson breathing room by applying temporary tariffs. Unlike some of the broad sweeping protectionist legislation being bandied about in Washington, the idea is ultimately to increase trade between nations, not impeded. When you hear talk about a tough trade bill, remember that being tough on trade and commerce, the lifeblood of the economy, will have the worst possible consequences for the consumer and the American worker. First, it will drive up the price of much of what we buy. But worse than that, it could drag us into an economy-destroying trade war. All right, so that was Donald Trump talking about how he's against tariffs, and again, this is the. That was Ronald Reagan. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, that's what right. I meant. Ronald Reagan. Yeah, you know, I get those two <laughs> confused because they're so similar. I get confused too, Max. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Oh, so, so let's. Uh, I mean, obviously they disagree on that, and honestly, I think that it, it, what Donald Trump is calling for his biggest policy that I have an, uh, a fundamental problem with is the. These tariffs is 35 to 45 percent increase on on good coming from China, Japan, Mexico. This is going to put places like Walmart, Walgreens, uh, and uh, like uh, some of these at Target, some of these pla- all these places that that sell cheap Chinese goods. They're going to end up going out of business because they're not going to be able to compete. That's going to put Americans out of jobs or out of work, and that's going to hurt the economy. And in addition to that, it's going to force every single American to pay more for goods that they're already and they have to purchase already because these a lot of these things are, are things that you have to get like food or I'm not necessarily food but let's say let's say clothing or things like that it's cheap stuff that we're all already spending every time you go to Walmart and you spend your money there you're you're get you're profiting from these cheap foreign goods and it's not going to help I, again what this is talking about is the largest no no other candidate out there to include Hillary Clinton is even recommending increasing taxes this much much. Donald Trump is the high tax candidate. I don't think it can be argued. People, more people are going to be paying more money to the federal government in order to, to force us to buy American products, which we're not producing because we're being overregulated to death. So, I mean, this is this is my issue with Donald Trump. This is why I'm Donald Trump. And at this point this year, by the way, Dan, you keep sending me stuff about Gary Johnson. I'm, I'm not voting for Gary 
Johnson guarantee. <laughs> I've told you this. You're not. Uh, no, no. I said I'm not voting for Jerry, Gary Johnson guaranteed. I don't. I don't know who I'm going to vote for. But the more time it goes you on, are I really. For Gary Johnson, you know it. I really don't think I'm actually going to honestly because he. You know, he you are. No, nah, I don't think so. I think this year I'm just. Uh, I'm going to protest vote honestly. I, I don't know though. Something could change. I don't Trump know. Is a perfect Trump protest vote. No, he's not. He's the burn the freaking yeah. system down vote, uh, and that's not what I want. I'm anti-revolution. I'm anti-chaos. I I want peace and tranquility. Well, I don't want to burn the system down because what? when we do, then why don't you vote for Hillary? Jeez. Yeah. Oh well, that, that because again, that that's she's embracing these radicals on the left. She's embracing. I'm kidding. I don't care. About her. I'm just I'm just putting it out there. I'm just saying the 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 reason why I'm not voting for Donald Trump is because I think he's a progressive and he's going to be bad for America. The reason why I am not voting for Hillary is because she's a progressive and she's going to be bad for America. Now, yeah, maybe there's a a, a flip of the dot or a flip of the coin that Donald Trump. Will, will do some good things? I, I don't think so. And I think he's already causing more damage to the conservative movement. But I want to focus here, Dan, I want to ask you a question here because Donald Trump just recently did an interview here on uh, American exceptionalism. And I'm sure you're, you're familiar with what he said, but let me just play it for the benefit of the audience. Donald Trump says he does not believe in American exceptionalism. Here's a clip. Define American exceptionalism. Does American exceptionalism Exceptionalism still exists, and uh, what do we do to grow American exceptionalism? Okay, well, I don't like the term. I'll be honest with you. And I'll, people say, oh, he's not patriotic. Look, if I'm a Russian, or if I'm a German, or if I'm a person we do business with, why, you know, I don't think it's a very nice term. If we're exceptional, you're not. First of all, Germany is eating our lunch. So they say, why are you exceptional? We're doing a lot better than you. I never liked the term. And perhaps that's because. I don't have a very big ego, not any terms like that. But honestly. Like so the audience is laughing at that, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if he intended that to be a part, joke. I didn't get the part, the part that was funny at all, at all at the end there. So. Oh, so, well, the, Dan, I, I wanted to ask you, because I, I think this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what American exceptionalism is. And let me ask you, yeah, what, is, what is American exceptionalism to you? Somebody needs to re-educate him. Uh, well, American exceptionalism is is a culture that's created in the United States of America by acknowledging our fundamental rights as human beings. Okay, which has created a culture which has been more productive and pro and produced more wealth than any other nation in the history of man. Okay, and it's still, despite all the shackles you put on it, is still there. Okay, and it's created a spirit by treating each and every person as an individual that has unalienable rights, inalienable rights, unalienable rights in the United States, okay, has created a culture of people who believe that they can change their lot in life and that they can produce things that no one else has ever produced. It's what gives us more Nobel Prize winners than any other country in the history of the planet, more multimillionaires come out of the ashes inside the United States than any other country in the history of the planet. So when you talk about American exceptionalism, that's what's meant by American exceptionalism, okay? What Donald Trump is saying there, and I'm, I wouldn't say that he's the most educated man on topics of uh, history or economics. I would say that he, he's got a little bit of work to do in that, in that particular area. And he's saying in this example that American exceptionalism, as I understand what he's trying to say here, is people who believe that they deserve something even though, they, they, without having to work for it. That's what I get out of his, out of his mess because they're an American. Uh, and of course, I, I don't agree. That, I don't agree with that at all. And that's not what American exceptionalism is. I think he. I think he thinks that American exceptionalism is us just saying that we're better, or we have some kind of supremacy complex where, where we're saying that we're better than you simply because we're Americans. And, and again, it, I, I agree with you. It's about the philosophy of freedom that we have. It's about the idea that we unleashed human incentive to, to pursue their own self interest and. and, and had the government, we have a system, at least we, we started with a system that the, the government had very little role in your life. And now, obviously, we're getting more and more restricted. But however, we are still the freest society in the world. And that is American exceptionalism. It, the people in America aren't better than anyone else and anywhere else. We're be we have American exceptionalism because of our philosophy of freedom. So, Mark, next topic here is for you. 
and I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about this. Donald Trump is now requesting, here's a story that you linked me from uh, dailykos.com, Donald Trump will require uh, patriotism to be taught in schools. Uh, he's quoted, we will stop apologizing for America here. And this is my, my issue with this, is that if Donald Trump doesn't understand the philosophy of American exceptionalism, what is he teaching in patriotism? This, is, this to me sounds nationalism rather than patriotism. What do you believe, Mark? I don't believe he actually even takes this role seriously. I don't even think that he even really cares about presidency. I think he is such a megalomaniac, he's such an egomaniac, that he isn't even looking at this particular role as even feasible. This is a man that has no political experience. This is a man who has really, uh, has really never been in a situation where any average American has ever been in. He's just simply speaking to the two of what he believes is what he can impress. And so when he speaks out of one side of his mouth and then he speaks out of the other, it's kind of like how the Clintons did before the Internet when they really could get away with it. In other words, I could go into one room, I could say one thing, I could go into the other room, I could say another thing, and I wouldn't be called out by the next room for saying the prior thing because nobody really knew about it. But this is a man who's been given $2 billion of free press simply for talking out of both sides of his mouth really talking out of his ass, and this is the kind of man who really has no legitimacy to be the president of the United States. I'm not necessarily saying that Hillary Clinton does or anybody else that was in the Democrat or Republican primary did. What I am saying is, is that this is a man who's not taking the presidency seriously. So when you're looking at a situation of requiring patriotism, what I'm saying is not only does that sound very Fuhrer-esque, or very much like a, uh, a dictator would sound like, because of uh, the fact that I honestly believe this man feels that, wow, enough people are giving me this momentum, maybe I can be dictator, maybe I can do whatever it is that I want to do, because he's pretty much done whatever he's wanted to do in his entire career. But this is also a man that is looking at it and saying, how far can I go with just the psycho babble that I've been spewing in my mouth? And this is the kind of thing that I find just to be the most grotesque and the most reprehensible to the United States in general, is that we are putting, I mean, very intelligent people like Dan Sandini and a ton of other people are putting faith in a man that doesn't even really give a crap about this role. He really just thinks of it as some kind of a chess game or some kind of a thing that he honestly... I can't possibly think that this guy really cares about the United States when he has the kind of role that he has. I mean, when he puts the amount of jobs in China's hands when he makes the majority of his products overseas and yet complains about terrorists and then complains about, you know, nationalism and that tries to propose the idea that we're going, he's going to be a dictator and require patriotism to be in the United States school. This is a man that just is talking off the cuff and yet people are giving him credence simply because of the fact that he's not Hillary Clinton, simply because of the fact that he's not a Democrat, and simply because of the fact that he doesn't talk like the average politician. Well, honestly, the average politician has gotten its credence because of the fact that they actually talk the way that the American people want to be represented, which is typically a situation of I want to be represented in a manner of class, or I want to be represented in a manner of respect, or in a manner of some kind of, uh, say, example. But this is an example that I think we are going to look back on and be ashamed of. And this is something that Ronald Reagan would be rolling in his grave over. And this is the kind of example that, honestly, a man that did not vote for George W. Bush won for one second, but I would be praying to have him over Donald Trump. Oh Donald goodness. Trump is a disgrace and somebody that I honestly feel as if the majority of Republicans will regret voting for. I, I, I can't believe that I'm actually like wishing that it was between Clinton and Bush now. I, it's, it's blowing me. Like, you, you remember like the, the good old days back in, during the Bush era? Oh my goodness, jeez. You know, he was a disgrace. Yeah, it was somebody that I, had some I was not a fan you know? of Bush, but it's it's amazing how this 
it's this whole thing. The perception has shifted now to where I'm longing for the days of, of the Bush era. But, but, you know, I agree with you, Mark, that I don't I don't think that he does care. You know, he again, with the product, selling his products or creating his products overseas. And again, he said that if he loses, he doesn't really care. He's going to go on a long vacation. And he also said he doesn't care if Congress loses or if the Republicans lose Congress. He's he's like he doesn't mind being a free agent. I, I think he didn't even he didn't even endorse Paul Ryan until the last second. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, this is a man that has put his political life on the line for endorsing for the disgrace of Donald Trump as the Speaker of the House and stood by him. Through thick and thin, I mean, majority of thick, I mean, just horrible comments that this man has made. And then just basically waited it out until the very end, until basically the Republicans were saying, we are going to ban and ship until you actually endorse so, so, the House. And then he finally says, okay, I guess I'll endorse you. So, Dan, f- final okay. thoughts on this. So I want to give you the, the, the last say on this. Uh, you know, I want to be fair here. So, so give it, give you like a minute here. We're, we're up against the clock, but give you a minute here to, number, to get you Number one, he's, okay, he's pro-tariff. He's pro doing a fair assessment of what the tariffs should be and is speaking in language that people's, people understand. Number two, we've been teaching civics class inside of school since time immortal here in the United States of America. Kids have been standing up for the Pledge of Allegiance since time immortal. It doesn't make you a Nazi to say that. It's common sense for people to say stuff like that. Number three. That's, that's, that's a fair comment. Yeah, so hold on, hold on, Mark, now. I gave you No, one but it's fair. You're fair. I'll, you give you, I'll, give you I'll give you yours. Uh, I'll give you your, your, your two cents. I mean, I gave you your time. You give me my but time. I'll give you time. Okay, okay. You're right. Okay. You're right. Okay. You're right. Okay. Well, my time, okay? And number three, Hillary Clinton is a hell of a lot more than a liar. She is a criminal who is responsible for the deaths of hundreds of Americans by leaking classified information and for showing poor leadership and acting incompetently in cases like Benghazi and starting wars in Libya. We know what we're going to get with Hillary Clinton. You're going to get more criminal behavior, and you are going to get more than Americans, and that's what's going to be on you guys' hands when you don't vote for Donald Trump. Oh, man. Okay. All right. You voted for George W. Uh, Bush. Hold, hold this on. is a man who's thrown us into war. In, in How do you know why I go to war in Iraq? All right, you know hold on, I guys. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, We're okay, up against the clock. Right. Guys, don't hold on. Maybe I don't know that. Hold on. Good We're up against the clock. I don't have time for this. Sorry, guys. Uh, we got we got to run. I appreciate you both joining us here. It, it, we're gonna have to do, do this again sometime. Do it again. I love you, Mark. I yeah. love you. I love you, man. I love <laughs> you, Dan. And yeah, let's do this next week. All right, guys. All yeah. right. Well, hey, if if you want to come back next week, Dan, I'm more than happy to do this. Mark, you're invited as well as usual. Uh, but I really appreciate it, folks. I, I thank you so much for joining us, uh, Mark and Dan. Thanks, man. Uh, you guys are awesome. Thank, thank you, you so guys. much. All right. Well, thanks. I, we we gotta we gotta run. Thanks so much. And as far as for you, Mac, Mac I just wanna I wanna say thank you so much for tuning in week after week. You guys are the reason why we we do this. And in fact, I wanna read some of your your quotes here before we run on uh, or your your post here on the on the eighth grader recites white boy privilege poem. Uh, Josh says W T F question mark. Uh, James says the public school and our PC culture have been uh, way too successful at brainwashing our youth. Kathy says white privilege may be rich privilege, not white. That so-called poem is racist in itself. It implicates that all white people have it easy and are given everything. So not true. This coming from a white woman who works very hard to support herself and my children because the man I was married to decided after 16 years of marriage to walk out with everything we had in the bank. I do not feel privileged at all. I feel strong. Uh, She continues to say that kid is brainwashed. Warren says white privilege is another way of keeping racism and ethnic wars alive rather than teach everyone to be comfortable in their own skin uh, the way they are uh, in which which everyone uh, which would actually help people. Granted, there are small tiers of privilege that, that is built into the system to keep people from revolting. True privilege is held at the billion dollar level and above and it has nothing to do with ethnicity. There are Middle Eastern billionaires. The Rothschild family is worth hundreds of trillions. No one knows the worth of Queen of, Queen of England. Or you could be the leader of uh, one of the few nations, nations that are not part of the UN. They, called, uh, they call him the Pope. <laughs> that guy has some serious privilege. And uh, let's see, we're scrolling through here. Um, Sarah on here says, God, I made it to the words, I'm scared before I couldn't take it anymore. She closed out. Uh, Tom uh, says, I'm, uh, this is the sort of crap that pisses me off to no end. 
And uh, Larkin says, uh, what is white privilege and who gives it to you? We discussed that on this show. Uh, I really appreciate you guys tuning in week after week. If uh, if you would, follow us on Spreaker.com slash on the move show. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E. ER.com slash on the move show. Uh, check us out on our website on the move show.com. Click the shop link, buy our products to support the program. If you like what we're doing, I certainly would appreciate it. And uh, don't forget to follow us on uh, Twitter at on the move show. Like us on facebook.com slash on the move show. And again, thank you so much for tuning in, folks. Uh, we broadcast every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at on the move show.com or our hub spreaker.com slash on the move show and as always know your rights know your rights assert your rights and get on the move i forgot that again y'all take care